Fit Toys. At Arizona State University, we've made online education better, smarter, and more personalized, so you can go further in your aspiring field. I decided to pursue medicine once I realized that ASU did have the online program for biological sciences. You're still required to learn the same curriculum. You're still being tested on the same content that anyone would be tested on in person. The comprehensiveness of the program prepared me so well for medical school. Explore over 300 programs at asuonline.asu.edu. Hey, what's happening? Mike Schmidt, 40 year old boy podcast, trying to adjust the microphone levels just so. I like them to be just so. I like to Goldilocks the shit out of these microphone levels. Because uh, who knows, man? You could be close up. You could have your, your earbuds jammed deeply into your head. Your earpod vagina could be plugged in and blaring all over your house. I'm not sure. All I know is I don't want to overdrive the microphone. I don't want a maximum overdrive the microphone. I don't want a Green Goblin truck the microphone. I don't want a Stephen King novel the microphone. I don't want a Stephen King movie. The microphone. I don't want to overdrive this thing. I don't want to love drive this thing either. I don't want a Scorpions album, this microphone. Look at me talking in circles. Look at me sitting at a desk. <laughs> I'm very accomplished. I'm a podcaster sitting at a desk staring at a microphone. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm not staring at a microphone. That would seem weird. That would make for a bad show. I'm going I'm to go on the record right now. If I just sat here and stared at the microphone, that's a bad show. I'm staring at a screen, certainly, but I can't be staring at the microphone. Actually, you know what? What if I did? What if I just stared at the microphone? Would that work? Do you think that would work somehow? If I was somehow thought about my show being put to tape? Tape? Hi. How you doing? I'm from 1970. I, uh, <laughs> being put to tape. I'm recording on a tape. I got a big reel-to-reel. You know how I do my business. Um... Yeah, I just sit here and concentrate and it shows up. That would be perfect. See, that's exactly how I'm going to handle it. I just want to think. I don't want to talk. I don't want to use my mouth, my tongue, my teeth, my uvula. Over the teeth, the tongue. What's that rhyme? There's a rhyme like old people do when they do a toast at New Year's Eve, I think. Like old Lang Syne is, what, is a thing. But then there was like uh, the teeth, the tongue, the throat, the tickle, the whatever the fuck. I don't know. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, but again, hear me thinking all of these things super quickly as I stare at the microphone and I try to convert my show. You know what? That's even... I'm going to take that out. I'm going to take that excuse while we're here. I'm going to tell you this right now. If I ever don't put out a show, and and when has that ever happened? <laughs> Come on, guys. We're all in this together. If I ever don't put out a show, if there's ever a week where a show does not show up, let me say this to you right now. Please know that I was recording the show with my mind. <laughs> and something was wrong with the tape, which, you know, I'm going to blame the tape. I'm blaming all of the tech stuff. I'm blaming the computer. I'm blaming the real to real. I'm blaming my producer, Rick Rubin, as he sits on the floor with his beard barefoot and disgusts everybody, then bothers Paul McCartney for an hour. Uh, I haven't, I only saw one clip where Rick Rubin is like trying to make Paul McCartney listen to some. Now, I will tell you this. I don't even know what's real. I'll be truthful because the clip I saw, Rick Rubin is like, hey, you want to hear something? And Paul McCartney is like, sure, 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 Rick. Of course I do. Why wouldn't I? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why Paul McCartney's a cartoon giraffe in my rendition, but that's fine. So, Rick, why don't you play it? I'd like to hear what you got queued up for me. I, I, that's is that Liverpudlian enough? I don't know if I I don't I can't do a Liverpudlian accent. Look, I don't do a lot of accents. I got to be honest, but I try. I'm I'm always in the neighborhood. That might be a instead of a Liverpudlian, uh, it's just a pud. <laughs> I'm just a pud doing that accent, guys. I don't know why I'm yawning. I had a decent amount of sleep. I, you know, I still got jet stuff going on. I just got to town a couple of days ago. Uh, I'm in I'm in Los Angeles, as you know, not Los Angeles proper. I'm in one of its surrounding communities. I don't want to say where I can't I can't go ahead and pinpoint it just in case Israel is listening. <laughs> listening. 
I couldn't even get that out. Sorry, I'm affected by the fact that all day long, my all my social media is tastes great, less filling between Israel and Palestine. Um, and look, I'm not laughing at the situation. Here's me. Here's where I got to backtrack again. I'm not laughing at the situation, clearly. I'm laughing at the uh, all of the absurdities that have come out of the situation. Terrible things are afoot. We know this. I, I think I talked about them last week. Uh, I, what if I didn't? I, I think I talked about them last week. Did I? I'm not sure if I did. No, I know I did because everything's going to hell. But uh, I'm not so. Please, no, don't write me. And go, oh, how dare you chuckle at that? How dare you chortle at the at the plight of these people? I, I'm not. I'm just. I'm just saying that. Uh, I don't know, man. Again, the fact that everybody has got uh, an aggressive opinion and demands that I hear it, and also demands that you tote that barge and hoist that bale and follow whatever their way of thinking might be. You know what they are? They're urge overkill. They want you to come around to my way of thinking. There's no time to lose. Uh, I've been watching. Look, here's what I do now. I live on YouTube. I live on YouTube. I didn't in Chicago because let me tell you a little something about my friend David Hernandez. I stayed with David, David Mex Hernandez. I stayed with him and uh, I did not get to do a deep dive into YouTube. There were, I would tell you this, YouTube's a miracle. There's a, th- a billion things I wanted to show David. I wanted to go, you should see this clip from 1970. And they were all music related. Because I learned last time I was uh, home, David, uh, he fears change. He does not like, he, let's put it this way. He doesn't like what he doesn't like. He doesn't like anything new. He likes what he likes. And I can understand that mindset. But if you trust me and you know that I kind of I'm in the same wheelhouse ballpark as you at least comedically wouldn't you trust me if I said dude there's a thing you have to watch it's great and he's like I don't watch tv anymore and I'm like that's fine but I'm but you know let me show you these this is like one episode of the show is 15 minutes long no and he was he was like mad that I would even suggest it this is the last time I was home so this time uh I did not I didn't bother oh but and if you're wondering what the thing I was going to show him was it was uh I think you should leave with our friend Tim Robinson, which if you don't know about it here, I'm going to sit, hold on. I have to drink some water to suppress a yawn that was coming. I, here's what I, I shut my, I shove my yawns down with a, with a tsunami of water down my gullet. Um, if you haven't th- seen, I think you should leave with Tim Robinson on Netflix. Let me just wholeheartedly recommend it to you. I'm not going to go on and on about it. Uh, but, but listen to me. If you, if you watch the episode with the driving crooner. Because I'll tell you this, you don't need, it's not one of those things where yeah, I meet people all the time who are like, man, you should watch this show. The first season is really slow, but it hits its stride in the second season. And then I'm always like, why the fuck would I watch 10 episodes of something that's not good or is getting somewhere? And then all of a sudden it's whiz bang in the second season. I want whiz bang from the jump. You got to rope me in, baby. I'm a runaway steer. I'm Ferdinand the bull. I'm trouncing through the daisies. Throw a lasso around me and fucking tame me with your first fucking episode, because otherwise plenty of other daisies in the barn or on the field or whatever the fuck for me to munch on or smell, whatever he did. Uh, so that's the deal. When everybody hits me with that, like, it's like, uh, I have never watched, uh, I, I can't even think of the name of the fucking show. I love Catherine O'Hara. I love Eugene Levy. Shit's Creek. I've never seen it. I don't. And I truthfully, I've never had an overwhelming urge to see it. All I know is people have told me, they're like, oh man, it's really good. And I'm like, okay, cool. I I should check it out. And they're like, well, the first season is really slow. That's usually my baseline for in any reference in this way. But it seems like all shows are like that. The the morning show on Apple. Everyone's like, you should check it out. The first season's rough, but you know, the the performances are great. And uh, Billy Crudup is is amazing. Jennifer Anderson does a nice job. Everybody, everybody says the acting is real good. And, uh, but they said, but you gotta, you gotta stick with it. And I'm like, I don't. Dudes, man, I'm going to be dead in 20 years. I can't stick with anything. I barely stick with breathing, this show, eating. Well, no, I stick with eating. But I mean, anything else, I'm like, I can't. There, There is so much product. There is so much. I hate to use this word because I think it's being bastardized and it's changing the way we look at art content, whether it's on YouTube or TikTok or, you know, any of the streaming services. There is so much for you to consume or or lose yourself in that I can't be given the recommendation of, hey, man, this is a great show. You got to give it about eight hours for it to warm up. It's like, dude, I got news for you. That's four movies that I could watch that I would fucking love, or at least I would learn whether I liked them or not. Some new things I could delve into. You know what? Here's, here's another thing. Check this out. I'm going to give you a word you probably haven't heard in a while. Books. 
books exist. I have so many books that I've got to read. And I just, and I've got another, I just asked Pat to borrow a book and I'll get to that in a minute. But I, I well, it's not like it's a big story, whatever the fuck, but I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to lose track of where I'm at right now. So people recommend they're like, you should do this. You should do that. You should watch this. You should watch that. Um, so I, I, you know, and I'm no different and I, but I always qualify. I'll go, cause again, I learned my lesson with you guys. Like I told you about Mandy, like the movie Mandy with Nicolas Cage and everybody's like, cool. And all I heard from people is who hated it. People just were just wrote me. I think a couple people may have liked it. Most people were like, wow, that's fucking weird. Boy, I didn't. Yeah, I wasn't. You liked that. I'm like, yeah, I fucking loved it. So that was the turning point for me where I realized that maybe my tastes are different from everybody else's. So I guess I can respect David for not wanting to watch the thing I said, but it's 15 minutes out of your life to vote 15 minutes to see whether it's good or not. And I, like I said, and I will tell you this too, <laughs> I've tried to get my comedian friends to watch. I think you should leave. They have no interest. They, they. They don't care for what they what they would call cringe comedy or whatever you want to fucking call it. And and again, I understand that too because when it's done poorly, I also do not want to see it. I don't like fucking prank shows for that very reason. I don't want any of the, anything that makes me upset, anything that, that's disquieting, anything that makes my stomach do a backflip. I got no fucking interest in tuning into uh, because I don't know what's going to happen to somebody. And I I can see the elements of that, and I think you should leave. I see elements of that in Tim and Eric. Great job. Uh, which I, another show I love. Um, so I get if those aren't for people, but, but give it a shot. Cause also Max, Max loves Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Now I, I don't know which of us watched it first, but we both fucking loved it. He loves Squidbillies and he told me he's like, you gotta watch Squidbillies. Now I haven't watched Squidbillies because if you know, uh, you, well, you know certain things about me, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I don't, I'm not a cartoon guy. I, I can't commit. And also I can't commit <laughs> when the cartoons are disgusting looking. And it's like Bob's Burgers. Bob's Burgers could be the funniest fucking show ever created, the best comedy of the past 60 years, and I couldn't get past their goofy fucking heads. They all look like sex toys. I got no fucking interest in looking at Bob's Burgers because they're all disgusting renditions. They look like someone painted a family and then something rain. They rain left it out in the rain. They left it out in the rain and the whole family ran, and it's just it's just so fucking horrible. They look terrible. I got no interest in it big schnoogle noses and fucking round bulbous heads. It's like, it's like watching a bunch of cocks hang out in a burger shop or whatever the fuck. No, thank you. Not interested. Um, and squid billies too is the same way. They're like, they're gross looking weird and they're, they're monster, whatever the fuck. I, you don't need to hear my hangups. Yeah, you do. This is the show. What if, what if I didn't do my hangups? Hold on. I'm going to broadcast my hangups to you with my mind. <laughs> Think about it. All right. Um, so I was at David's and like, I wanted him to see some YouTube stuff and I'm like, Hey man, you know, but all well, here's what David does. David, he, <laughs> this is, he doesn't watch TV anymore. The only thing David watches is a show on national geographic called air disasters. And, uh, while it's fun, it's shocking to me that he, it's an every night thing for him. If he watches television, he, if, you know, he doesn't watch television every night, but if he watches television, uh, he gets high and watches air disasters and, uh, and he, he's rooting for the biggest body count you could possibly have. So we watch, and I watched some great ones and I was like, and I enjoyed it. I had a good time cause I like hanging out with David and laughing at shit. That's totally funny. But in the old days we used to flip around. Like we, that's how I watched guys and dolls. Cause he happened to, he flipped and it was on. He's like, Oh my God, you got, you've never seen this. And he put it, I think he put it in the DVD. Uh, you know, we used to flip channels and look at sports or look at other things. And, and, and we'd catch some old movie that we loved. But now, man, the remote sits on the table and we watch air disasters. It's very, uh, how do I put this? Uh, Grandpa-esque. Because, you know, he's got, dude, he's got a perfect life. He's got a beautiful wife. He's got beautiful kids. He's done his job as a father. He's fucking incredibly talented. He's writing music. He's doing his own show, as you know, the Flemcat podcast. So he doesn't need any sort of disruption or change to the routine. And uh, and so, and and also, th there is no change or disruption to the routine. Literally. Like, if I said, hey, let's watch something else, he'd go, no. <laughs> we're watching air disasters and I've, I, uh, look, I won't lie. Frustrating, uh, enjoyable. I, cause I'm hanging out with David and watching air disasters. And I even told him when I would text him coming home, like, Hey man, cue up the air disasters. Cause I just like hanging out with him and, and laughing at shit. Uh, but also I wanted him like, I, I've been going on YouTube and I've been watching a ton of performances, like a ton of amazing music and stuff like that. Uh, you know, stuff from the seventies, uh, there's a show called, the Midnight Special, which you've seen, and I mean, there's a clip of you know Fleetwood Mac doing Rhiannon and doing Dreams live, and they do it live. The bands play live, sing live, which is 
overwhelming when you watch it because you realize, again, not only do you love this con I hate the word, you, you love this music, you love these songs, but at the same time, you uh, it's astonishing. It's like a magic trick because you're, you're being affected by it somehow mentally and physically, but at the same time, you're watching them uh, perform magic in front of your very eyes by the alchemy of, of a perfect song, the alchemy of a band that's clicked in and honed in. I watched, there's another show called Don Kirshner's Rock Concert. And they were the same way. It was like it was like a midnight special on CBS. Midnight special was on NBC by me. Don Kirshner's rock concert was a CBS version on Friday nights. Midnight special was on. Also, I was that on Friday? Yeah, because Saturday Night Live was on Saturday. So uh, midnight special and Don Kirshner were both on Friday night. And I, I'm telling you, dude, there's a clip. I'm gonna I, look. I'm just and I don't want to. Well, fuck you. I don't. I was gonna say I don't want to turn this into this, but I don't give a fuck. What am I? It's my show. What the fuck am I doing? Uh, there's a clip of Cheap Trick on Don Kirshner's rock concert. Now I will say this. Uh, I oftentimes I'm like, Oh boy, this show is like, you know, I keep saying this stuff and I'm the oldest man alive and nobody knows what I'm talking about. It's time to come around to the thought that I don't have a young audience. I have, uh, you know, and nothing against you guys, but I'm saying you're all of a, you're all probably, you know, somewhere from 35 to 60, I would guess. Uh, that, and I, I know, I look, I know, of uh, one young lady who listens, who's listened to me her entire, basically half of her life. I know another young man who's about the same age as Ash, who's uh, Les Rubin. He's listened forever as well. Uh, and there are people who are younger who may have listened to me for a very long time. So that's, which is great. But I'm saying the, the bulk of people, the majority of people are uh, probably within 15 years of me on either side. Although, wait a minute, that would be, that would be 71. I don't know. Is there a 71 year old person out there listening to me? Perhaps there is. Uh, do you, let me ask you this when, as if you're 71 and you, and you listen to me do you go, ah, these kids today, <laughs> do you sit there, you think to yourself, ah, this, this, what, let me ask you, what shenanigans has this whippersnapper gotten himself into now? I'm going to tune in on the old Victrola and find out. <laughs> um, so that's, that's my guess. So when I say, cause I talk about bands, you know, like, uh, look, I could talk about Taylor Swift if you wanted. I'm finding, you know, there's some of her music that I really enjoy that I've listened to. And, and so, but I, at the same time, that's not what's moving me at the, at the, in, for the time being. I'm, I'm going on YouTube and finding a lot of uh, the stuff, certainly from my youth and bands that are still active today. And, and look, don't, don't trick yourself into seeing your favorite bands from the past today. I, I will say this, my buddy Pat saw Kiss and then he was like, you should go. This is a couple of weeks ago and I couldn't because I was, I was trying to make some money before I went out of town. And then he saw them and he's like, oh, my God, Paul Stanley was so bad. It was so bad tonight. I'm like, oh, what a bummer, because Paul has you know, lost his voice with Kiss. And then I watched some of the clips on YouTube because, again, you can see fucking anything almost instantaneously. And I was like, this isn't that bad. I mean, it's not as bad as I thought, because I've heard him sound worse. I saw him live uh, with our with our friend Erica. We went, thanks, courtesy of our friend uh, Jamers. And I went, this is five years ago, seven years ago. And uh, Paul's voice was fucking shot that night. And, and Gene made up for it by being a demon, being a beast, being fucking incredible. He carried the weight on his shoulders. Uh, so when Pat was like, oh, he's so bad. And I watched it. But if you watch, but I will say this, there are full shows from the Destroyer tour on stage uh, or on, on YouTube, I should say. So and you don't care. Nobody likes Kiss. But like, uh, all right, let's get into the then and now thing. Like there, there are clips. You know, I love Van Halen. It's my favorite band. You know, Eddie was my guy. Uh, you can see clips of Van Halen in their heyday, like clips of them from Fresno in fucking 78. And just fuck when they were amazing and they were just full of fucking testosterone and f and, and just f and fuck you. That's what they were full of. They were just full of pussy and fuck you. And they are so good. Uh, and then, you know, you watch them as they get older and you watch them. It, it, you know, it changes a little bit like uh I just watched, all right, so, and that's, so Van Halen, the reason I bring them up is because then, you know, Dave leaves and Sammy shows up, and I know, look, I'm not here for that fight, you know, does Sammy, blah, blah, I, Dave, blah, 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 I hate it, look, uh, I was in it for Eddie, I'm glad Eddie was there the whole time, if Eddie was there, I don't, I, I was in there for Sharon, I didn't give a fuck about Gary Sharon, I was in there for Eddie, now, are the Dave albums better than the Sammy albums, it depends on what you're looking at, and I'm not going to go into this fucking thing, I'm sure I did in the Van Halen podcast, whatever the fuck, um, it depends on what you love. Love what you love. Like what you like. If you like, if you like Sam ha Sam Sammy Hagar Van Halen, good for you. If you like David Lee Roth Van Halen, good for you. If you like Air Disasters all night long, good for you. Whatever you want to do is fine with me. I'm not. I'm not telling you to change your life or be somebody different. Uh, for me, for me, 
I love all of it because of Eddie, but if I'm going to gravitate, it's going to be the first five albums. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt because dad has also the baked in nostalgia of me discovering them. So finding them and having them become a part of my life, that's that's the first five albums. So you're not going to argue with that. And then Different Kind of Truth is fucking phenomenal when Dave came back, whatever, I've talked about this a billion times. But, 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 uh, you know, Sammy split and then he and Eddie had problems and then I've heard they made up as Eddie was was dying and I don't know if that's true. And, and even so, what does it matter to me? You know what I mean? I mean, it's I like that story where I'm like, yay, that would be cool if they were friends. But also at the same time, I'm I'm. <laughs> it's not like I'm going to be like, oh, no, I don't I don't understand people who get like that, but they do. Um, So I, I hope they're OK. But he, the reason I bring this up is because uh, I'm talking about then and now and what you liked then and what it is now. And you have to in your brain. You have to qualify what you're seeing sometimes. Like I, Rick Springfield, I, I'll just, I'll pivot to this. I like Rick Springfield a lot. You know, I love him. I love his music. I've seen him live like, you know, probably 10 times. Uh, huge fan. But uh, I went and saw Rick Springfield a couple of weeks ago. I went and saw him with Pat. I don't know if I mentioned that on here or not. And uh, we had like fifth row seats because Pat is a wizard and we're there waiting. Now, I will tell you, the show started out with Tommy Two Tone and then uh, after Tommy Two Tone, Oh, you know what? I think I talked about this on fucking Mexico show. I'm not, I can't bore you with it. I, I you've, you've already listened. To, well, and some of you may not listen to David show. I have no idea. So maybe I should still cover it here. All right. I won't, I won't go into a deep dive because I know I covered it on there. Uh, but Tommy two tone was your opener. And then the Hooters were, were second. And then Rick Springfield. But the point is Rick Springfield, Rick Springfield came out and uh, he's had surgery. And I, I was shocked by it because he is 74 years old. He looks and he looks great. He looks great. But then when he came out with the surgery, he had that, you know, that thing where it looks, they get like apple cheeks, like their cheeks get real big and shiny. And then the bottom of their face is like, they, they, you ever see handsome Squidward? <laughs> that You'll get an idea of what I'm talking about. If you've seen a handsome Squidward, that's that facial surgery where you're like your whole face tapers down. I don't know if they're shaving bone off your jaw or whatever the fuck they're doing. And then your cheekbone, they're putting it in your cheekbones, which become bigger. Uh, you look like an illustration of a light bulb because your whole your your head has curves like a woman's body almost like there's an almost a built in lady waist at your jaw. It's fucking crazy looking and women do it to themselves all the time. Men do it sometimes as well. And Rick Springfield has done it at 74. And the craziest thing in the show, because he comes out and we saw him and, you know, we can see him up close because we're in the fifth row. But then he's on the big screens, too, which are flanking the stage. And Pat looked at me and I just went, oh, dude. And he goes, he's had surgery. And I go, yep. Yeah, holy shit, what did it do to his face? Uh, now, did he still sing well? Yes. Were the shows, was it fun? Were the Was the music great? Yes. Uh, were there angles where he didn't have that surgery, or at least it looked like he didn't? Yes. But the worst part, the worst thing he did, because here's the thing, I don't know, I don't know if he's going to look like this going forward. I don't know if it's one of those things where you get this surgery, and it takes two months for your face to calm down. And he just went out too soon. Like, I have no idea because it seems like a kind of surgery he could have got over the holidays and then he could have come back in January and nobody would have said a fucking thing. You know what I mean? Uh, if that's how surgery works. But his face, it wasn't prednisone swollen, but it, ju it just looked odd. Like I said, it was tapered down on the jaw like a lady waist. And then the big bulbous fucking, I'll show I have photos if you want to see him. But even, you know, it's weird. I, I have an iPhone 10 and I have to get the iPhone 15 because AT&T owes me a phone. Uh, here's a lot of information about me that now you can look up, idiot. Um, but seriously, I, I need to get the new phone. But I take photos with my phone, and I don't think they're good. Like, I mean, I have the 10, and the camera is supposed to be really good and stuff. But when I'm, I mean, I'm in the fifth row. I'm not far, and it's still grainy when I take the photos. You know what's hard to photograph? I'm going to tell you this right now, the moon. I, I, I photographed the moon, and, and you're like, why are you photographing the moon? Fucking Frank Sinatra in 1941. Uh, here's why. Like when I was dating somebody, they were far away. And so I would literally take the picture and text it to them. And I'd say, hey, this is what our moon looks like here. Uh, you know, because it's, you know, you're together. It's 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 a nice way to reach out. And it's because that's as far away as that person was. This was something we could share by looking up, whether whether I could reach out and touch them uh, was was irrelevant because I could look up and see the very same thing that their eyes were looking at. So it was, a, I would, you know, I would send it and say, Hey, look, here's our moon, you know? And, and so, but these photographs, I, I, it's just, I'm taking a picture of a dot in the fucking sky. Like, and I see people post photographs and they're like, here's a picture I took of the moon. And I'm like, is that the sea of tranquility? How the fuck did you do that? Do you have, maybe you have a sea of tranquility setting on your goddamn phone. Is that how this works? Because I got, 
I get a pinpoint of light. I, I don't even know it, it's how to, how to make it better or worse or how to make it work. I, I point the phone I, and I try to do that thing where you, you, know, you use your thumbs to expand and get closer. And uh, no, man, it just makes it almost even more grainy. Jesus fucking Christ. Everybody else, you know, they're like, here's a picture I took of the moon. And it's the face with the rocket in the eye from the old movie. But somehow they got it in real life. And I'm like, how did that fucking happen? Are you on an, what side of the world are you on? Is this the dark side of the moon that I've heard so much about? I have no idea. Because when I go to photograph the moon, it's like, take get a picture through a fucking keyhole and, and through the keyhole right to a, just a window with the sun coming through it because it's nothing but this tiny pinhole of fucking light i don't get it and i will tell you this does this speak to my skills as a photographer perhaps it does why don't you get off my cock because honestly i'm not going to sit here and tell you that i'm a great photographer but it's a fucking phone point and click and shoot right wheel snipe selly that's how you handle your business um so then Springfield, you know, like I said, I'll show you pictures, but the pictures I have, remember, they're super grainy anyway. So I don't know if you can tell he has a fucking surgery. Although, you know, honestly, he looks like the fucking alien in E.T. Or no, in Close Encounters getting off the fucking plane, like the shadow. The plane? Why is it alien on a plane? <laughs> I missed that up like nine times. The alien in E.T. getting off the plane. No, the alien in Close Encounters getting off the spaceship when he's at all, like half a shadow or whatever the fuck. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, all right. So that's the deal. I... I I can't take photographs. But anyway, so I, I so I saw Rick, and again, the music was good. Oh, and here was the craziest part of the show. At one point, Springfield is on stage, and he's going to sing his new song, like his, his, his off the new album. And I will tell you, this is the first new album I don't care for. He, usually, he puts out new music all the time. And I like the albums. I can usually find at least like five songs that I like on the album. Because I'm, I'm not one of these guys who's like, everything he does is great. But I'm also not like David, who's like, he sucks, they suck, new music sucks, everything sucks, they turned it down a key, a tone, whatever the fuck is, I don't know, maybe Beethoven hated Mozart, I get no fucking idea. Not that, and, and that would, you know what's funny? That would make Max Beethoven in this in this analogy, and it would make Rick Springfield Mozart. And I think the former is a lot closer than the latter, to be truly honest, but that's okay. Um... But like, you know, David, he hates all of it. He hates all the, any, any band I see, any music I like. He's just like, why would you do that? Why would you go? And I, I don't know, because it's fun. And I go out with my friend and nostalgic because I saw Yes. And it was, it was none of the guys in Yes. Uh, did I tell you I saw Yes? I don't know if I did. I might've talked about that too with Pat. I saw Yes uh, with Pat. And, and I, it was funny because I knew, uh, so on the way there, I'm like, oh man, I'm, he's like, I don't know how much Yes, you know? And I go, I'm, dude, I'm just excited to go and hang out. I want to see Chris Squire play bass because he fucking tears it up. He's like, yeah. Uh, Chris Squire, he's, uh, he's dead. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I know I'm teasing. That's fine. But that's okay. Cause I can see Alan White on drums and he's fucking amazing. And he's like, Alan White, not in the band. And I'm like, oh, all right, well that's fine because John Anderson's vocals are fucking incredible. He goes, yeah, John Anderson, not also, also not in the band. <laughs> and I knew these things, but I was just being a dick. Uh, and so we go see, yes, well, let me finish the Springfield thing. Springfield, when he's on stage, uh, he, he does his new song. Okay. And, uh, they play the video for the new song on the big screens. There's a screen behind him and then two flanking big screens so everybody can see it. And by the way, Rick draws a really great crowd. He had sold out this theater. I don't know how many were comps, but he was doing real well. The place was packed. So, uh, and that's, and again, that's baked in nostalgia and everything else. And a lot of MILFs who want to go see Day, uh, uh, Rick and, and, you know, get, get fucking juicy thinking about their fucking teenage years. It's fine. Um, which I understand. And again, I, I don't begrudge anybody this experience. We've talked about it before. When I went to see, when I was at Wisconsin fucking Summerfest and we went and saw D. Snyder and fucking Lynch Mob and all that, it's whenever I saw any show, Motley Crue, anybody, it's these, it's these people my age who want to pull out their old jeans and their spiked wristband and maybe put, you know, take their kid and put a bunch of gel in his hair and try to introduce him to the thing that they used to love, even though their kid is yawning. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's understandable. I see it all the time. Uh, so Rick plays the new video behind him and on the screens and it's old, it's Rick's old face. So you're, you're looking at the video. It's very jarring because Rick's old, because I will tell you this again, Rick's old face looked fine. I don't know what mouse got loose in his head and started scurrying about and making him think that there was problems. But in the, in the video that I saw, he looked fine. He's again, 74, but he looked amazing for 74. Like he didn't look, he, even if he looked 60, it's fucking incredible. But I mean, he, you know, he's got the dyed, he dyes his hair clearly. I mean, he's got to, there's no way he's got black hair at 74. Maybe he does. I don't know. But, I, you know, watching the video, you're like, oh, that's Rick Springfield. That's what he, And then you look at this fucking madam from Wayland Flowers and madam face. You know what I mean? On, on the stage, you're like, Jesus fucking Christ, man, what is going on? Uh, but that he looked like a marionette. That's what he looked like. I, I wish he didn't, but he did. So I don't know why the change. And I, But I'm hoping this. I will tell you, it, it looks like 
Like he, I will tell you this, maybe he didn't have surgery. Maybe he tripped and his head got stuck in a beehive. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he was doing some yard work at his house and he was attacked by wasps. I don't know, but something happened to his fucking face. And uh, it's a drag. And I, I, I prefer to think he did it involuntarily. But if he did it voluntarily, yeah, hey, buddy, why didn't you watch your last video and realize you still look great? Certainly great for 74. But, you know, here's the problem. When you're 74, you don't want to hear, man, you look great for 74. You want to hear, you look young. You haven't changed. You look great. You look amazing. That's And especially if you're some fucking narcissistic musician, you don't want to hear nobody settling into their old age with a guitar around their fucking shoulders on stage. You know what I mean? There's nobody up there who's like, ah, uh, you know, the I'm wistful because the passage of time has stolen my looks and my glory. Bling, 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 bling. You know what I mean? Nobody talks about that shit. They want to go up there and sing Jesse's Girl. So what the fuck? Uh, and, and, I, and I get it, man. I understand it. Because I'll tell you this, I'm uh, going through a little crisis of conscience my own self these days. And, I, and uh, I'm old. I know this. We all know that I know that I'm old. I have thought I was old for a while. Uh, and I told you, you know, at my age, we've talked about it a million times. Uh, when I was a kid, my age was like old, like fucking, you know, black socks and shorts, short sleeve button shirts, you know, that, that kind of thing, handful of pomade, all that shit. Uh, but now uh, I'm this age and I don't feel this age. Uh, why well, part of me does. Well, I'll get to that in a second. But, I, you know, I said, I'll catch I'll catch a look at myself. And I'm like, you know, you don't really look that age. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. But uh, but then occasionally when I'm not looking through my uh, whatever rose colored glasses, I guess I see I'll catch a glimpse of myself in the mirror from the side or I'll see myself. And I'm like, if, you know, if you don't control the angle and you look at it from away, you're like, holy shit. Yeah, maybe I do look old. Maybe I am an old person. Uh, or let's put it this way. I am an old person, but maybe I do look every second of my age. I don't know. I don't know, but I know there, there are shots that'll fool me occasionally. And I, I, you know, in comedy, you talk about a thing called laugh ears. When a guy comes off stage, he's like, man, that was great. I killed it. And in your brain. You're just like, dude, you fucking bombed. I mean, what an eat. I can't believe you didn't choke on how bad that went. Uh, but people think they do great. They convince themselves they do great. They have laugh ears. Well, I'm wondering if I have, uh, you know, looks eyes, I guess would be a good way to put it, where I look at myself and I'm like, no, I don't, I don't think I look 56 and I don't think I do this or whatever the fuck. And I go to the gym and I lift and I feel good. Um, but at the same time, occasionally I'll catch a glimpse and go, Oy. and uh, a lot of that happened this weekend where I was, uh, <laughs> this, I'll just, I'll just tell you this, uh, you know, a lot of people photographed me and I was in Chicago this weekend and I, I, <clears throat> I was on stage and then come off and then, you know, all the social media, I meet a ton of people and I, I, you know, they're, they're there to see Lenny, but then, you know, some people were there to see me, which was nice. And so I wind up meeting people and you're hugging people and they want to take photos and everything's really cool. And then they go to social media and they print those photos and you, you don't have control of the angle. You don't have control of, you know, how you're going to look. So they'll put these photos up. And again, I will tell you this again, I, as you know, uh, I'm in the middle, like at the pandemic, I went fucking bananas. I put on 93 pounds. Well, I've lost 55 since then, which is good. And I've lost 55 since the last time I was in Chicago, which is good, but I still need to lose at least 80 pounds to, to look decent or normal or good. In my opinion, I want to do that. Um, so these people take photos and, and as I've said many, many times before from like, from like the chest up, I'll, I'm everything you could possibly want. I mean, I'm, you know, the mouth is amazing, you know, in, in ways that you can't even imagine, uh, my shoulders, my arms, my traps, you know, fucking, and then, you know, talking at the speed of my head, all this stuff. I would, I would put from my, from the chest up, I would put me on the line with anybody, uh, from the chest down. However, no great chicks, as we've talked about many times, particularly because, uh, I dove into a swimming pool full of ravioli for two years and turned into a monster. And I've been, had this never ending battle of losing, gaining, losing, gaining. Well, in the middle of a losing phase now, but it doesn't matter. You know, there's, I still don't look, I would say I don't look great. But part of me thinks that doesn't even look good sometimes. And when you see these photos these people put up, I have no idea why people put up full body shots. I don't understand it. Because again, from, from the chest down, 
I I look like someone who needs an operation. I mean, I it's, it, it, clearly, and I've had the operation. Like I'm just I'm just a big fat dude. It just it's true. That's the way it is. And, uh, you know, it, and it doesn't matter. Like I've said before, it's like suit of armor wrapped in baloney. It doesn't matter. The previous damage I've done, I wear it around myself like a meat cloak. It's just there. And I'm not boo-hooing. It's a fact of life. I've done it myself. I need to work to fix it. But people who take photos, who put up these photos, and again, maybe it's because these people, they think they look great too. They they don't. And, and I will tell you this, because people are like, you look great. And I'm like, you're very nice. But in my brain, I'm like, I do not look great. I, I know when I look great and I've looked great in the past, you know what I mean? And, uh, but also you can't do that hang up to people. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll be like, Oh, you're very nice. Well, you're very nice. Thank you. Um, you can't go, I don't look great. And by the way, let me choose all, look through all these photos and pick the ones you're going to use. <laughs> Cause I, I don't understand why anybody would ever use a full body shot. It doesn't make any sense. Like you can easily crop it to be shoulders up, you know, with the, with the heads. I, I, I it just, but you know what? People kept posting photos and I kept seeing them and I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ. And then this is funny. I had a conversation with Lenny at one point. I'll tell you about it in a minute. But I was talking to Lenny and we were talking about how the week went and being on stage and everything. And and I told him, uh, you know, whatever, some stuff. And I'd mentioned, you know, on stage, it is I'm starting to wonder about how I look on stage. You know, like I don't you know, I'm me, whatever the fuck. You're not going to do anything. You got to fix whatever you're going to fix. But I'm wondering if crowds are expecting a certain thing from me because of the way I look. Crowds who don't know who I am. Like you guys, if you come see me, you know who I am. So you know what's up. But I'm wondering if crowds, when I get up there, you know, 6'2", 3, 340, 338 these days uh, with this haircut, I'm wondering if people are expecting me to talk a whole lot about beating the shit out of immigrants. Like, I, I don't know. You know what I mean? I, I mentioned this one thing. There was a joke online. There was like the meme of January 6th, like the January 6th starter kit. And it was a gray goatee, sunglasses, baseball hat, and Nike Air Monarchs. And I, I read it and I'm like, I, and at the time, uh, I was, I forget where I was waiting to get my haircut or something. And at the time I had, you know, I have the gray goatee and I had the Nike Air Monarchs on. And I had mentioned him to Max and he laughed at me. And I go, I go, dude, I have, and so I feel like I always have to fucking prove bona fides in some way. I have like 12 pairs of fucking Air Jordans and amazing shoes. I just don't wear them every day because I don't want them to get fucking dirty. I don't want to fuck them up. Like this week when I went to Chicago, I wore some Air Jordans. I was happy about it. I was, I finally got to wear my shoes, but to wear them out in California, just when you're Ubering or whatever the fuck, it just, they're going to get dirty for no reason. What's the point? Save them for stage or save them for whatever. So I would just wear the Air Monarchs because I, I, I was like, they're 40 bucks. Who the fuck cares? I, I can wear them all over the fucking place. They're shitty shoes. It's like when people wear their yard shoes or whatever the fuck. You know, I, I have a pair of fucking Converse that I've had for over 20 years that I love. I fucking love. I wish I could find a, a, they're a skate shoe and they're fucking amazing. I would wear those every day, but I also, then I'm like, I don't want them to fall apart. <laughs> I don't want to lose them. So I'll wear them occasionally. Um, but when I saw, you know, I read the fucking gray goatee and the Nike Air Monarchs, I'm just like, oh, Jesus Christ, you know, fuck, I, I, I know it's an old person thing, but I wouldn't, I didn't wear them on stage in, in Chicago. I, I haven't given up, I guess is the point I'm saying And, and maybe, but also maybe people just, they don't, there are people that don't care and, and that's totally fine. And it, because, oh, so the, the whole point I was telling you about the Lenny thing. So whatever, I was talking to him about that and I was mentioning, you know, it's, it's an uncomfortable thing because on stage already, I'm trying to get back into the groove of doing stand up. But then in my head, I'm thinking, how do I look like I, you know, from certain angles and I, I'm not, I'm not comfortable in my own body, but I'm trying not to give off that vibe. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I told him this and he's just like, dude, you don't have to worry about that. You know, it's just, if you're funny and nothing matters, just get all these different things. And then, uh, later I didn't even know he was doing it. He took a sneak photo of me sitting on a chair and it's it's a full body shot from the side which is even worse because then my barrel gut is there with my arms perched on top visit i'm fucking frustrated waiting for something and uh and he posts it on social media he just posted this is this is an hour and a half after i told him you know man i don't feel great about how i fucking look it's a drag i just got to lose so much weight and blah blah blah. he's like yeah man don't worry about it shouldn't be it's not a problem and then he posts that fucking picture and i see it and and i just in my brain i'm like and again, I could be very clearly deluding myself into how I look, but I'm not because I know I don't look good. I, I'm, I, that's the whole problem of it is I know I don't look great and I want to look good. So I would love to control the narrative about how I look. I can do it here at the house. 
I mean, the very picture that you're looking at right now associated with the show, uh, I don't think I have a fresh one. Maybe I'll use an old one. What if I did that? What if I just found some old one from when I really looked great? <laughs> ah, I was doing that anyway. I was just finding old pictures because I, I don't want to take a fucking selfie every goddamn week to go ahead and attach to this show. And so sometimes I'd use old photos. Uh, but still, who knows what we'll do. But anyway, Lenny posted that photo. And, I'm, and I, in my brain, I'm just like, dude, what the, what the hell, man? And again, there are people who they, they either don't care how they look in photos or they all think they look great. Which is fine. And look, I've experienced that too because social media, you'll get people, I, all these people I know or grew up with or whatever, they'll put up pictures and it'll just be like some picture where they they look like a fucking Halloween pumpkin on November 28th. You know what I mean? And and they're just like this sagging horror. And everybody's like, looking good, man. You look hot. So great. So beautiful. What a great photo. And I'm like, dude, I don't, this ain't helping in my, in my opinion, but I, but also you can't be like, boo, you look like a squash jack-o'-lantern. You don't, you don't want to be that fucking jag off, but you have to have self-awareness of how you look. But I guess if you're putting up a photo, because I, like I said, I control the angle of the photo. So I think I look okay. And, I, and look, by the way, this is absolutely therapy on the couch time. You know, this, I don't mean to bury you in this bullshit. I'm just telling you honestly how I feel. Um, but it, but it's, I, I, I don't understand the idea of of just putting up bad photos because because Max will make fun of me. He's like, oh, I got to make the Schmidt face. I got to make the smile face. I got to do this. Oh, I got to. Oh, yeah. You know, you uh, people put up good selfies. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I put up a good selfie because what am I going to do? Put up a bad photo of myself? No, I'm going to try to look the best I possibly can in the fucking photo. And and, you know, it's for a control group of your friends and and. They know what you look like. Everybody knows what you look like. The problem is, do you know what you look like? And I'm very, very honest. I know I don't look great. But also, then, so then I'll tell you this. Max puts out, I'm, I'm on, uh, if you didn't know this, I'm on the Flemcat podcast this week, folks. I'm on the Flemcat podcast. Did you know that? I am. It's true. Uh, I'm on the Flemcat podcast. And uh, <laughs> Max put out a painting uh, to say that I was on the show. And uh, I, I don't, like, I, in my brain, I'm like, is that how he sees me? Because the guy in the photo, look, and I'm a big dude. There's no doubt about it. And he's always drawn me as a big dude or painted me as a big guy. And I get that. Uh, but my, my goatee is snow white, which is fine. There's a little flex of brown in it, but over the fuck, it's a hard control thing when you're painting, I guess I'm not an artist. Uh, but then uh, he gave me all white hair. And uh, uh, I, I don't have white hair. I've done that thing where if I don't put gunk in my hair, you can clearly see there's a ton of silver in it, which is fine. And I don't mind it. I like the way it looks. But I have to admit, when he painted me, I was like, am I am I Gandalf? Like, I don't think I'm Gandalf. I mean, I, I have a pretty keen idea of what I look like. And I know I need to look a whole lot fucking better. But then when I see that, I'm just like, Wait, do I? is that how I look to people? Do I look like a fucking... Like an old wizard? I, I mean, maybe I do. I don't know. Like, it would be cooler. Like, I wish. You know who I wish I looked like is, you know, it's so funny. Because uh, my haircut and then the and the silver or gray. I was like, well, what about, what if I look like Cable from Deadpool? But the, here's the problem. When you when you want, you know, you I don't. Because clearly I don't look like Josh Brolin. His face is all angles. I'm a big dude. We get all that. But what I'm saying is when I sit in the, when I'm sat in the chair to get my haircut with a new person. And I go, hey, it's, my hair looks like this. And I'll show them old photos of me. And then I have photos of John Hamm from Baby Driver. And I'm like, that's kind of the cut. It's like, it falls there. It goes here, whatever. But I always go, look, please don't think I look like John Hamm from Baby Driver. I don't think I do. It's just a haircut. I'm not trying to be like, I know, you know, I'm not deluding myself. And then they're like, it's fine. I get what you're doing, but you have to kind of go overboard to go, Hey, yeah, I'm not, uh, I, I, I don't think I look like this. Seriously. Please don't think I'm trying to say, make me look like John Hamm. Cause there are people that look at the catalog that go, I want to look like this guy. And then you'll do their haircut. And they're like, I still look like me, man. What the fuck? I thought I was supposed to look like the guy in the catalog. And it's like, well, your hair does, but you're not going to fucking look like that. I'm keenly aware of all of my shortcomings. And where I need to improve. And that would be fucking everywhere. But then when you see endless physical evidence, photographic evidence, you're you just, it, uh, it wears you out. Not going to lie. It wears you out. You, in your brain, you're just like, dude, I don't even, what the fuck? <laughs> and, and, uh, and I'm fine. You know what I mean? But I will admit there are those moments where you're just like, holy fuck, what happened to me? And I know what happened to me. Me. I happened to me. That's the fucking problem. But in the middle of fixing it, 
but then mad at yourself because you backslid again. And you know, guys know this. I've lost, I've, I've gained and lost over a hundred pounds. Got to be 10, 15 times now. I mean, and just, you know, Hey, put on a ton of weight. Hey, lose a bunch of weight. Hey, put on a ton of weight. Hey, lose a bunch of weight. It's just, it's just the way it is. And then I had so much more, you know, whatever the fuck I'm I, now I'm just a crying shit. But again, when I talk about it, it's so funny. I talk about being, I'm old, uh, but I'm not, I'm like, I'm not that old, but then get this. This is completely, I I'm, uh, I'm starting to get old people stuff, which I wasn't aware of. You know what, you know, it's starting to, this is going to be a laugh. Probably, uh, my left hip is starting to hurt, not, not hurt, uh, like ache if I cross my legs or whatever, like that kind of, it's only in certain positions, not, not, not like constant, but if I like cross my legs, my left hip will bark. And it's this weird thing where I'm like, wait a minute, that didn't happen. So then I asked my brothers, I'm like, hey, man, does anybody here have arthritis? And my brother Andy is racked with it. And I said, I have like a weird ache in the in like my hip joint. He goes, oh, yeah, that's it. It's starting. And I'm like, oh, Jesus fucking Christ. All right, great. I don't know what to do. And then uh, just in the last couple of days since I got back from Los Angeles, my right knee has, uh, has swelled up a bit. And, and is uh, again, these aren't pain. You know, I'm not. There's always the phrase, I'm hurt, not injured. Injured means you can't do anything. Hurt means, well, whatever the fuck, take a couple of aspirin and walk it off. Um, so I got, but I got the hip and then I got a left hip and right knee. And uh, it's, it's happened. I somehow, uh, the Mohammed Atta of age has crashed in the twin towers of my legs. <laughs> I don't know how else to explain it to you. I, the, the knee thing I can, exp- the knee thing I could absolutely, I know what it is. It's uh, because I've been driving a ton. So if I'm driving it, like I drove the the Saturday before I flew out of town, I drove 14 hours. So, I mean, it's just trying to chase cash. So I I was, uh, I was driving a bunch and even, even I got home on the plane, like late Monday, like super late one in the morning. Uh, well, that's not super late. It's super late to fly in, but not super late for me. You know what I mean? I go to bed at fucking five or six, but anyway, yesterday I went out to drive last night and I drove like five hours. Yeah. Uh, because I've, I look folks. I'm Patty labelling it. I've got a new attitude. I've turned it around. I've, I've, I'm setting a work schedule for myself every day. New a podcast every week. We're coming here and talking to you guys. It's it's uh, whatever. I'm I'm making an effort, and I don't need any attaboys. I like them, but I don't need you to come along and go, "Yay, Mike!" It's not. I'm not telling you that for this reason. It's just time. It's always been time. It was time thirty years ago to do these kinds of things. So. Um, I've embarked upon a new, you know, like I said, a work schedule and I have, I have goals of what I need to do every single day. Uh, and then we're, and then every week this show, and then, uh, the week in Chicago, I, I need to get back on stage a lot more, it, it, whatever. So, but that's all going to be hard to do with the new left hip and right knee that are about to crumble around because of Osama bin fucking Laden, that jag off, uh, and the Saudi government, the Saudi government has come for my legs. They understand what kind of a threat I am. If I'm ambulatory. They want to put me in a chair, damn it. Want me in a jazzy. And I tell you, you think you think that'll take me off your trail, Saudis. But I'm gonna tell you this right now. You I you you've never met a more dangerous man than a than a fat guy in a jazzy. Oh my goodness. I'll I'll chase you. I will chase you for miles. I might be going ten miles an hour. It might take me uh, not, not even what does a jazzy even go ten miles an hour? I might be going four miles an hour. But uh, but eventually I will I'll run you down. I'll chase you to the ends of the earth. God damn it. In my jazzy. Now, how do, do I have to stop and charge it? I don't know how those work. Do I have to get gas in it? I don't know. <laughs> I got to figure as my legs are failing me. I should start to look for jazzy instructions to understand what the fuck I got to do. Uh, I go back. To, I'm back in the gym next Monday and I'm, I'm excited, you know, to get to get back into cardio. Because I, I will say this, the the you know, when I drove hardcore Uber seven, 2017, 18, whatever the fuck. Uh, I was going to the gym all the time too. And so my cardio was, would kind of offset the, the sitting forever in the fucking car. So I liked going to the gym and stretching out and fucking running and all that. That was fun. And like I said, when I was in 2019, I was up to four miles a day. It was fucking amazing. And the weight was melting off. And then guess what happened? Somebody ate a bat in China. Do da, do da. Somebody ate a bat in China. Oh, do da day. And it made me stay inside my house for years. And then I found myself eating all the ravioli in town. Uh, <laughs> so I, uh, so my legs are I, a coin flip right now. I'm sure I'll be fine, but it's uh, you know, it's, it, but it's, it's, it's beginning. It's happening. And, and I, I'm soon, I'm I'm going to feel as old as I look in photographs and paintings as as I've just experienced over the fucking past week. Um, oh, the whole thing was I was telling you I was I was on YouTube like watching again the bands of my youth, uh, 
And when you see them in their youth, they're fucking whipping ass, man. I mean, they're fucking incredible. But then at the same time, uh, you see them now and you're like, ah, hey, like uh, Aerosmith is on their farewell tour. And uh, they're like, yeah, man. And then they, they added the Black Crows. As if I wasn't interested enough, they added the Black Crows, whom you may know I, I really enjoy. I'm a huge fan of the Black Crows. I've seen them live like six times. So I was like, wow, I've never seen Aerosmith. I wanted to see the Farewell Tour, but then you throw in the Crows. I'm excited for this. But the thing is, here's about here's what I'm telling you about Aerosmith. Uh, I, you know, I love Aerosmith. And I will tell you this, Toys in the Attic is a seminal album in my life. Like, I, I absolutely... Uh, it was one of those albums that I just was, I came of age to, I would listen to it every single day. And, uh, you know, after I found Van Halen and that kind of led me to Aerosmith, then I'd listen to toys in the attic over and over. And I'd listen to uncle salty and it just sounded like something I'd it, like nothing I'd ever heard before. So, uh, so I, and then I went back and listened to rocks and all that stuff and dude, draw the line. What a fucking song. So when I, when they're doing this final tour and it, cause then, then they, you know, then they all do drugs a million times and then the toxic twins go through rehab and they come back with the run DMC song and they still look like corpses. Like Tyler looks fucking awful in that video. No matter what you think it was their comeback, certainly, but Tyler still looks like something that crawled out of a grave and you're like, Jesus fucking Christ. These guys don't have long for the earth, but then they meet Diane Warren. And hello, ballads. How you doing, popular songs? What's up, MTV? And they 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 didn't reinvent themselves because they were still doing rock, but it wasn't like the fucking gutter rock that they used to do kind of thing. And, and, and you know, they Tyler wasn't singing directly into a needle. You know what I mean? They, they had kind of cleaned up their act. And so they were and, and God love them. They got this this renaissance, this second act, third act, fourth act, whatever you want to call it for their career. And they and they had huge albums by bringing in co-writers and doing songs that were written for them. And, and they made tons of fucking money. And then Tyler transcended the band and he's on American Idol, whatever the fuck. It's crazy. It's a crazy thing. And now, of course, Tyler is he's probably 74 like Rick and and he's a nut. He's absolutely insane. He is certifiable. When you see him, he's just he's dressed like your aunt. He just, He just looks like some crazy old grandma in a wig shop. It's fucking wild, but, but he's a rock star you know I mean? and he's still singing about his dick, which is fucking weird as fuck. You're like, dude, no way there's, I don't good luck getting it up with a crane. I mean, I don't know, maybe Viagra Cialis, but it just, to me, it seems like Steven Tyler has done so many drugs that if Viagra and Cialis show up, they'd be like a new kids in a tough school and they'd try to do their job and then we get stopped, <laughs> get stopped right at the waist. Hey, where, where do you think you're going? There's just heroin and cocaine. Where the fuck do you think you're going? Well, uh, we're going to work. Where, where do you work? Uh, we work downstairs. Nah, nobody goes downstairs. What you, I, but that's our job. You know, we, we're supposed to. No, nobody goes fucking downstairs. If you, if you, you know what you, you, know you got to do? Go back. Go back. Yeah, obviously, you got sent to the wrong place. I mean, whatever the fuck. Fucking drugs are not letting Steven Tyler, Cialis, and Viagra work. Viagra? Viagra. Uh but maybe it does. I don't know. I'm not that old yet. I, 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 luckily, I haven't had to delve into that just yet. Um, but I will also, I'm alone. <laughs> I'd be burning. I'd be burning Viagra on myself for fuck's sake. Um, so uh, the new show that I watched. So there's a there's a whole show of Aerosmith on this tour. So I was wanting them to have like I want, if I'm going to see them, that's great. But I want to see the old songs. I'm, I don't know how many old songs they've been, but also it's a it's a dilemma because I don't want to look at the set list before I'm going. But at the same time, I kind of want to know what they're going to do. You know, I, I was going to ask Pat, can you look at the set list? Tell me if it's worth it, that kind of thing. But I've never seen them before. So isn't it worth it? Right. I mean, I, I guess anything would be worth it just to even be in the building with them. Um, and you think that un- until you see them. Uh and as I've said before, and I'm going to say it again, if you're a rock star, never retire. If people are willing to sell you, uh, you know, or buy you, buy two hours of you, buy nostalgia from you, by all means, keep going out there. Don't you're a rock star. People are paying you to be a rock star. Keep being a fucking rock star. Whether you're whether you're 40, 50, 70, whatever the fuck, how old are you? Because what, what are you going to do? Like I said, what are you going to go get work at Kinko's? Is Steven Tyler going to quit and go get a job bagging groceries? Fuck no. Is he going to enjoy his retirement? I would think that. If you're Steven Tyler, why wouldn't you just fucking put on your moo and your weird hair clips and go fucking live in the south of France and just drink good wine and, and try to eat good pussy? You know what I mean? Whatever the fuck. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know what motivates these guys. And again, they're all half narcissists anyway, if not more than that. And 
it's really hard. I can't, you know, with all the drugs that Steven Tyler has done, all the drugs that every band has ever done, I have to imagine the most powerful one is the people cheering for you and wanting to see you every night because that is just, you're just shooting love directly into your fucking veins. And to be loved by that many people at once, Jesus fucking Christ. I mean, again, I... I go up in front of small crowds and, and I know the fucking rush I get. I can't even imagine going up in front of 25,000 people. So, uh, I went and looked at, <laughs> I, I, against my better judgment, cause again, I didn't want to know the set list, but when I saw that they had a concert on YouTube, and again, this is a couple months ago, I, I went and watched it. It was a show and, uh, well, all right, I should say the, the thing that was, was the gateway to get me there was the black crows put up a clip on Facebook of them watching Aerosmith. Like they had finished their show and they were watching Aerosmith from the wings and Aerosmith was doing draw the line, which is like one of my favorite fucking Aerosmith songs. And I was so excited and they're just like Aerosmith. And, 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 but the funny part is (laughs) if you listen to draw the line, the original, uh, it, um, it's fast. Checkmate, honey. Beat you at your own damn game. Okay. So in the clip they're showing, they're singing Draw the Line, but it's... It's... Checkmate, honey. Beat you at your own damn game. And... I understand why it's because their lungs are ruined, or at least Steven Tyler's certainly are. So he can't keep up like you can't do a whole concert of of chugga chugga fucking here we go. Like, I can't even imagine if they tried to do train kept a rolling. You know what I mean? Like, it would be insane. But sure enough, they they've slowed everything down a beat. And so then you're realizing, oh, I'm not going to see 1977 Aerosmith. And I always know that anyway, but. But this this was a completely different animal. And Tyler, I will say in the clip I saw, eh, he uh, could, or I, I apologize, in the clip that they showed, it was fine. But then I went and saw the concert on YouTube, and uh, huh. all I can speculate is just before they went on stage, uh, they were having a warm-up game of Frisbee in the back, and someone distracted Steven Tyler, and Joe Perry hit him right in the Adam's apple because he shot. He's fucking shot, all right? And again, there's no shame in being shot. You're 75 and you've done fucking hard drugs your entire life. But uh, when the when the tickets are like 250 bucks in my brain, I got to go. Do I really want to do this? Like, is it do I how much nostalgia do I want to purchase and how much is it worth to me? I watched the whole show on YouTube, skipping, of course, forward a bunch. And uh, I can't. I it's just it was. Uh, <clears throat> it's not a nightmare. It's 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 fine. It's okay to fine. It's just nothing close to the to the superhero. It's like if you were like if everybody warned you about Godzilla, dude, fucking Godzilla. Have you seen Godzilla? He's gonna fucking come and stomp your town out. It's fucking Godzilla. He's gonna destroy the place. And you're getting fall abbed up and you're like, holy shit, you know, part of me wants to see this, but also at the same time it's fucking kinda terrifying. This gigantic fucking monster is gonna come and destroy the place. And everybody's like, Look, it's Godzilla. And then the Geico Gecko hops out of a car. And you're like, well, what the fuck? You're Godzilla? Hello, mate. Whatever the fuck he talks like. It's just, it's you're expecting one thing, the thing you knew, the thing that's in your DNA, the thing you loved, and you're getting the other. What you're getting is what they can give you. And they can't give you what they used to give you. Are you going to be okay with that? You've got If you've got to settle for leftover Aerosmith, that someone left out on the counter for, for 25 years. <laughs> Cause I'm assuming in 2000, they still sounded good. Um, think about that. 2000. Now that's tw- tw- 2000 is 23 years ago. And I'm thinking, I want to see 1977 Aerosmith, right? That, that was 23 years removed from this. So like in 2000, you're like, fuck man, I really wanted them to sound like 1977. Now in 2023, am I like, I really hope they sound like 2000. I mean, I, it's fucking crazy. And again, it's all about nostalgia, closing the book on chapters of your life and seeing people you wanted to see whom maybe you've never seen. But you have to understand, you have to realize, and you have to wonder, and you have to think, and you have to generalize, is it worth it? You have to, I'm sorry, rationalize, not generalize. You got to rationalize to yourself. Is this worth that? Now, 
when I wanted to see Kiss with makeup and you know all that. Yes, it was worth it. It was absolutely worth it. Um, Aerosmith, God, I just don't think so. I just don't. And then, by the way, this is all moot because uh, Tyler is done. Like he he's got there an undisclosed illness, which is his. I'm sure his throat is is fuck. It's he's shot. He's just shot. Maybe they went out and tried to do it. And now he realizes after, you know, whatever many performances, I can't fucking do this like this anymore. So maybe they just do like one giant farewell in Boston next year. You know, like for it, it would be easier to go out for one night and make it happen rather than a fucking tour. Tours are grueling, man. And you got to go out for two hours a night and fucking sing. And I will tell you this, dude. <coughs> Dream on was the encore. And it starts with just fucking Tyler and the piano. And uh, as as it starts, in my brain, I was wondering if he had somehow been shot with a tranquilizer gun from the fucking rafters because he's all over the place. I mean, it, it was so bad. And, and you know, I, I've went, I went through this with David Lee Roth and Van Halen on those tours where you just kind of have to come to grips. When I saw, when I saw Guns N' Roses, you know, Axel's version of it, Axel hadn't completely bottomed out yet. Axel was still okay to good in spots. It depends. There's range that you can hit. But as far as the high thing, the do you know where you are? All that shit. It's always been rough for him since the, you know, since the 90s. Uh, but now <laughs> Lily keeps sending me clips of, of Axel from TikTok. And, and I, I know why she's doing it. It's the same thing, you know. I would send a pad or whatever and go, Jesus Christ. But she, but she sent them to me now. Like, I think she sent like three or four, maybe even more. And, uh, and I'll write her and I go, yeah, I go, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's rough. I go, this is one of the reasons I didn't see them. And she'll just be like, I can't stop watching this. This is fascinating to me how bad it is. And, uh, I said, yeah, I, I know, but everybody gets old, man. It happens, you know, and if people are still willing to pay and she's like, yeah, but she, I, she's like, I don't feel bad though. If you choose to perform and you go out like this, then, you know, you kind of deserve, getting fingers pointed at you in my brain. I'm like, do you, or is the fact that you're still selling out 20,000 seats, seat stadiums, enough of an excuse for you to go out because people are buying 20% performance and 80% nostalgia. You know, nobody's going to see the, the fucking guns and roses. That was at the Ritz in 1987, you know, tearing the fucking place apart. You wish you hope, but you're just going there to hear the opening riff of jungle. And and hoping that the music and stuff takes you back to a place in a time that you want to remember fondly. And so so it's again I'm on the fence because as a comedian or a, you know an observer of pop culture or a satirist whatever the fuck you want to say, uh, my instinct is to bury everybody. What the fuck is this? Jesus Christ! This is awful. What a drag. But also as a human being, and someone who recognizes that the the human condition wants you to run back to places that were comfortable, wants you to experience things that remind you of your youth. I, I can't get too worked up about destroying these guys. You know, I, I, I will look, I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't. And anybody else who does, that's fine. I just find myself on the fence about it these days. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, Mick Jagger's 80 years old. And so whenever everybody's like, Oh my God, I can't fucking believe Jagger is just, you know, listen to this. And I'm like, I don't, so what? Like they just put out a new album. And uh, because I also do this, I go the other way. Pat's like, oh, my God, have you heard the new album? I'm like, nah. And he's like, it's good. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. And he's like, no, you should check it out. And and I'm just like, okay, maybe, you know, it's on the list. I always say I always go, it's on the list. And uh, and, you know, hopefully I'll hear it in passing because I'm never going to sit down and listen to the Rolling Stones new album because I don't care. I've I've I have all of the great things I need from the Rolling Stones. I'll hear a song because then. When I went to see Yes with Pat, <laughs> he's like, listen. So he threw the album on and he's like, this song's great. And I'm like, yeah, it's good. And, uh, you know, I'm never going to like things as much as he does. He's he's such a music guy and such a rock guy. He, he fucking falls right into it and he loves it so much. And I'm happy for him because I want him to find that enjoyment. That's I'd much rather somebody was like, this is great than going, Jesus Christ, this is fucking awful. You know, like I said with David, like he. I'll mention somebody or I'll go, Hey, I saw, like I saw yes. And he's like, why the fuck would you do that? And I'm like, I, because I went with my friend to hang out for the night and it was fun. And I go, but you know, the yes experience for me was a little different. Like, I don't, I don't mind 
cooling out. Like, because what's funny is if I said to Pat, yeah, you know, I was at my buddy David's house. We just watched air disasters all week. He'd be like, what? Why? And I'd be like, oh, my friend loves air disasters. So I'm, I'm perfectly capable of being a get along guy. You know, do I have strong opinions about what I like? Yeah. Would I like to show you things that I love or enjoy? Of course I would. I, you know, I've done this, unfortunately, where I'm like, hey, man, you got to listen to Jellyfish. No, you, I'm going to sit here and listen to the whole album with you like that. You know, there's things that I absolutely love that I want to bring into people's lives because I want them to experience them the way I do. But it's not going to work like that. Just like if somebody tells me to watch Shit's Creek and the whole year, the first year is a stiff. But after that, I'm like, well, I'm not going to watch the whole first year. No offense. Uh, it just doesn't seem like something that I would be into, you know. But then I'll tell people to watch. Hey, you should watch the Great British Baking Show. Our friend, you know, I have friends who I'll say, you got to watch because the, they're and friends who like cooking shows. I'll go, look, you know, we watch these and the, but these Food Network shows are inferior. You must watch the Great British Baking Show because not only is it more of a, a fun platform for baking, but it's also heartwarming. And it doesn't use schmaltzy backstory. It doesn't tell you, oh, you know, you know, my aunt had cancer and she taught me how to make pudding. You know what I mean? None of that. There's none of that shit. It's just people cooking together in a tent to become kind of a familial unit and root for one another. It's it's shocking, quite frankly, that you could have a reality show where everybody's nice to one another and rooting for good things for one another. You know, there's no. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm here to, I'm bringing it to win it. You know, you got to go big or go home. There might be some of that sort of in, in just passing, but what's really happening is it's people trying to do the best that they can and also encouraging these, this whole group of people that they've just found as a new baking family to also do the best that they possibly can. And, and they're trying to win the title of the great British bake off champion. And they they get a plaque, like they get a big plate, like a serving plate and a bunch of flowers. Like, I didn't think there's money. It's just about going out there and, and, and doing your best and, and encouraging others to do their best. You know, I've seen, you see people cry and other people run over to help them and do things. And, you know, here in, in, when you watch these dumb shows, everybody's fucking, you know, uh, fuck you, fuck your goddamn cupcakes. You know what I mean? I'm like, whatever, but I can't trick anybody into watching it. I'll say you should check that out. And they're like, eh, maybe, because maybe it's not for them. And that's that's the weird thing with with social media and everything, because we're all connected. We're all, everyone here is just connected at the hip, just electronically all the time. And so when you hear this cacophony of people, like the new Loki came out on Marvel, and I, I'm done. I can't. I don't want it. And then it was funny because Pat was also kind of wavering on some things. And he he's like, dude, Loki's amazing. It's really great. I just, I have, I all of my Marvel space has been taken up. Will it change eventually? Yeah, probably when a Spider-Man comes out or something. But, but right now, man, I got, I just don't have, I don't have the bandwidth to bring Loki into my life. And I got no interest in the Marvels. I mean, I, you know, when I saw the trailer for it. It looked like a sitcom. I'm like, is this what I want out of people wearing fucking spandex is again, goofy jokes. And Oh, by the way, you know, Captain Marvel, who's the most powerful being in the universe is now an idiot because little miss Marvel makes fun of her because she doesn't know how, you know, fucking, I don't know, make a Sunday or a trifle. I don't know what the fuck it was. Some bullshit, but it was like, I don't, I don't, it's not for me. And there, there, there comes a time where you just have to do that thing where you, uh, as a poker dealer or a, a craps dealer or not even a craps dealer, a fucking blackjack dealer, you just clap your hands at the table and walk away. You know, back off. Not for me. Um, you know, but I've been doing this deep dive in, in YouTube and finding, and I'm sure it's, it's some of it is nostalgia, okay? But also it's wanting to see greatness at its peak. So when I mentioned like the Don Kirshner's rock concert with Cheap Trick, and it's from 77, it's 30 minutes long. It's like 31 minutes. And it's hello there into come on, come on into hello kitties into Southern girls. And, and you're just watching it and they're monsters. They're absolute fucking monsters. They're just, just it's, it, it's crazy to watch the musicianship musicianship. And then, and then Xander sounds incredible. He looks amazing. And it's just filled with rock and roll attitude. Rick Nielsen's acting like a dork, but Tom Peterson balances it by being like a fucking, you know, looks like a New York doll for half the fucking thing in his leather jacket and his big bass. And you're, and again, it's music that means something to me because it's from when I was a kid, but at the same time, just watching the force of their performance is incredible. You know, you know who I've been doing a deep dive on? Like it was funny. I just mentioned about borrowing a, a book or whatever from Pat. 
like I, I've just gotten into the uh, into Pretenders for a while. Now I've always like I love the first two albums by Pretenders. That's and after that, you know, after Pete Farndon and James Honeyman Scott lo- were lost, you know, the third album is also great. It's fantastic, but it's not the same. And that was where I kind of turned, where I was like, mm, you know, it's learning to crawl, and it's it's a it's an incredible album. It's really good. It's just different from the first two because the first two are are fuck you. They're like they're just like a sneer. Chrissy Hind is just fucking. I, and she's so hot. She's so unbelievably hot, dude. So I, I wound up just doing a search. Like it came up because again, when you watch these things on on YouTube, you and again, is it? I don't want to forget the present. It's very easy to escape the present by going, "Oh man, remember my past." That's not what I'm doing. I'm watching to celebrate greatness. I'm watching honestly to see greatness that I missed that I never saw because YouTube is magical. Like I said, there are full destroyer sh- shows from the, the kiss destroyer tour on, on their video. Uh, I found all these old Van Halen, dude, this, this just recently happened at the beginning of October. Everybody's been impatient. They've been waiting for Wolf and Alex to go through Eddie's archives. Well, someone got tired of waiting and they just started releasing stuff on YouTube. So there's like a 20 minute track of of Ted Templeman in the studio with them, and then ju- them just playing live. Now and not because there are places that y- you could always find like Eddie's isolated guitar tracks, things like that. But you would always hear in the ba- it was a tool that they used and in the background. You could kind of hear the drum or the vocal or whatever. Well, not these isolated tracks that they're, they're, they're releasing are right from the board because you can hear Don Landy or Templeman say something to him just before it starts or right after it ends. And then there are these these demo songs. Like I have the Gene Simmons Zero demos. There, it's Van Halen did a demo. They're called the Zero demos, and Gene Simmons produced them. I've had those forever. Like I have my mic, whatever, and they're great. They're fantastic. But there's full full demos. Like I used to have bootleg albums. I used to have live albums. Of one of them at the Pasadena Civic when they were in '79, stuff like that. You know what I mean? But on YouTube, those those have been converted to audio. But then there's. There's some show they played at a high school when they were fucking 20. I mean, it, it's crazy what you can find on YouTube. And it is dangerous. Because you can sit there and just and just look and watch. And you. Lo- I do it. I've, I've been, if, you know, when I've not been shirking my duties, like I said, I'm back or whatever the fuck. But when I have time, I, I go in there and I watch. Like last night I got home after driving and I was just like, fuck it. I threw it on and I found... These live performances, you know, again, the Van Halen ones are amazing. I, I sit there and listen. I said to my brothers, and again, it's that same thing where my brothers are just like, oh, cool. And I'm like, it's not cool. This is like finding a, a a fucking Tyrannosaurus skull. I mean, it's shit that you never thought you'd hear or see. It's it, These are all unearthed treasures that you should absolutely fucking listen to right this second and tell me how great they are. <laughs> You know, and then and then when they don't, you just kind of I don't you know I don't browbeat anybody, but at the same time I'm like you would really benefit from seeing this. Like you should totally see this. There's a clip of Tool uh, doing sober at a festival, and it is phenomenal. It's fucking phenomenal. And it's funny I've sent it, and then Lenny wrote back and he goes, Jesus fucking Christ, I want to run through a fucking wall. I'm like, yep. But then I found a whole show of Tool from Philadelphia. It's like 48 minutes in some small club. There's like 12 people and it's it's that the fucking first album era and and Jesus dudes fucking they, you know it, it's crazy. You, so you sit there and you watch and you're like goddamn greatness. Look at fucking greatness. And uh so pretenders I'm watching all this live Chrissy Hine stuff and she's so good. She's she, she's just a powerhouse and I sent Pat a a, a video of Tattooed Love Boys from France. And uh, and it's funny, the crowd doesn't even know what to make of them because there's a break in the song that when they would do it live, people would cheer during the break and they would wait and let the cheer get bigger and then they'd hit the guitars again. But France, they just started cheering on the break because like, they thought the song was over and then they started playing the song again. But I sent it to him and I go, dude, Chrissy Hine, because you can, you know, Chrissy Hine is ice cold. I mean, like, she is so fucking cool and ice cold. But you can see the music getting to her in this version of, you know, when you're when you're watching Tattooed Love Boys. Because I didn't, you know, you see videos and she's doing what she's doing. But if you watch live stuff, I've never seen, I've never seen them live either. And they're here with Foo Fighters next year and I want to go so bad. But when you watch this in, in 1980 or 1979 and you see fucking Tattooed Love Boys and she's kind of 
fucking just doing a shimmy and she's grinding and she makes this fucking face where she kind of makes it she sings out of the side of her mouth and she's so hot it's ridiculous and crazy talented and and looks like she'd punch you right in the fucking face and it's amazing she's so incredibly kinetic and and charismatic and oh my god uh and i sent it to pat and i go i go dude this is ridiculous i go this is this is like a hurricane i want to fuck like because the sound of the band is so brutally intense and she's in front of it just just the ringleader of the whole deal but James Honeyman Scott is controlling the song with his guitar it's so fucking great dude and it's this thing where I want to put these clips up every day. Like I see this stuff and I want to share them like in social media like on Facebook. I'm like, "I, you know, I want to share this, share that, share this, share that." But then I'm like, "What's the point?" Because again, everybody in the world is sharing this and sharing that and sharing this and sharing that. And I I can't make people like stuff. Like I said, when I said Mandy, and everybody's like, "Eh." When I had the Holland album that I loved, and I said, "I'll send it to you free. It's it's this good. That's how much I love it. I want to just share it with people." So I said the Holland album to everybody, and I heard from people that was like, eh, nah, this is just 80s metal. Eh, it's just the same. And I'm like, well, don't you hear how fucking amazing Mike Beatty was on guitar? Like, the, there's this one song where he uses this harmonic trill as the fucking, like, nah, you know, it's just fucking, it's just like, sounds like hair metal. And uh, and that was when I went, you know what, why the fuck am I doing this? Why would I try to, telling people what what you like or going, oh my God, and expecting them to feel the exact same way you do? That's a fool's errand. It's not going to happen, man, because you're not going to trick people into liking the things you like the way you love them because they landed for you at a particular point in time. The Holland album came out in 85. The Bears were incredible. I was working at a record store. Uh, I, I was hanging out and going out every night. It was it was just a fun time. I mean, I was fucking 18 years old, 17. And, uh, and holy God, you know what I mean? It's not, you can't. Say to somebody, hey, man, you need to feel the way I felt when I was 17 and heard this album for the first time because it's just not going to land the same way. And every single one of you has that album, has that television show, has that movie, has that song that you know that it, it moves you in a way that nothing else does. And it brings you instantly back to the moment you heard it or the time period you heard it or the summer you heard it, and it makes you think to yourself, my God, that was an amazing time in my life. I'm saying everybody wants to go back there, but you want to remember how amazing it was, and you also know that if you send it to somebody else and said, hey, do this, and they'd be like, eh, you'd A, go, well, of course, they were not going to feel the same way I do, but also B, you'd be like, fuck you, man, eh, that song's amazing. God, when I first heard it, then you want to fucking avalanche everybody with what your experience was, and it's just, it can't be done. And I bring it up because, again, as I was talking, whatever, I don't know how we found ourselves here. I don't know what I was planning on telling you. But see, this is what happens when you got left hip, right knee. Left hip, right knee changes everything. Just fucking sit in the house now. Get, at least I'll watch YouTube with like a, like a buddy. Um, The Pretenders is just, you know, I Pretenders, I should say, is a band that you just, I watched a ton of clips. The live stuff is incredible. And you know who else? The Cars. When I was a kid, I always heard the cars are li- boring live. They're boring. Oh, my gosh, you can't watch the cars. Well, I'm watching all these live cr- clips from fucking the late 70s, early 80s. Because, again, the cars are another band. The first two albums are are fucking magic. Panorama is a good album. Uh, and then Heartbeat City goes crazy. But the fucking debut album by the cars is is a perfect album. There's one song maybe that you're like, nah. Uh, but the rest of it, forget it. And then the second album, Candio, dude, dude. Like I when I was a kid, I liked Candio more than the debut, and the debut that that three song suite of "Bye Bye Love" all mixed up and "Moving in Stereo" there at the end is just dude, it's fucking, it's incredible, it's incredible. I, I said them out of sequence. It's "Bye Bye Love," "Moving in Stereo," all mixed up, three song suite and fucking genius. And and by the way, also instantly brings me back to 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 my childhood to those moments, and and that's you know what. We make fun, I, I should say I do, you know, I'll, I'll make fun of people trying to experience this or looking, constantly searching for how they used to feel, even even when I do it myself to a certain extent. But I also, there's the cynic in me who just goes, you can't fucking do that. You can't be chasing shit that was in your past all the fucking time. It's just pointless. There's no point. Um, But it's, boy, it's a great cocoon and it's super comforting. And at this age, you know, I got a lot more past than I got future. So 
excuse me if I wind up spending time there. But I don't want to be that guy. I also don't want to be that guy. I don't want, I don't want to turn in my keys <laughs> and go, yeah, you know what? I'm done. I'm just going to go ahead and surf the wave at what used to be and, and not try to create any more coulds. Um, but the cars, man, if you watch, if you watch clips of them live, again, I was always, I was always told they were boring, but they have two riffs that are just fucking monstrous live. Like I watched these live clips of moving in stereo and it's because it's, you know, it starts up with a the real crisp guitar, you know, whatever. hi, Brad, you know how cute I always thought you were. <laughs> And then the the first verse, you know, the life is uh, life is strange, moving stereo, whatever the fuck. Um, and then, but then the gong gong when the bass kicks in, gong gong gong. It's in. It's a great riff on record, but when you watch them do it live, you're like, oh my god, the bottom on this is fucking crazy. And Benjamin Orr's voice was was brilliant always. I mean, it's crazy. You never when you watch any clip of them live, they're so good. So the the riff for moving in stereo, that fucking bottom, that boom. Boom, 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 is crazy good. But then also, fucking Candio is also a monster, dude. If you watch him do that live, because uh, it's just, it, the, you, you'd have to hear it. I'm not going to do the fucking, maybe I will, <laughs> whatever. But it's, it, but now, but now, dude, you love it. There, there's, they're so good. Um, I, but, but you watch them and they're incredible. I can't, I have no, good adjectives. I realize that I'm not selling it the way I should, but that's because it brings me to a place might not bring you to, you know, you, you, it, and it's funny because the, the tastes are so fucking disparate. Like, uh, like if someone told me about the grateful dead, I've had people, they're like, Oh man, you got to listen to the grateful dead. You got to listen to this. And I'd be like, never in a million fucking years. It's not for me. I just don't no interest. There's nothing there for me. And people are like, no, dude, you got to check it out. I'm like, yeah, I, I, I wish I could. I wish I could feel the things that you feel when you hear the Grateful Dead. But I, I just don't. It's just not there for me. It does not live inside of me the way it lives inside of you. But then that's why when you hear, like, I don't want to get trapped in the past either. Because when you hear stuff that's new, that makes you feel that way, it's shocking. Like the new the new Jason Isbell and the 400 unit, that, that album, dudes, it is... It's the best album of the year. There's no doubt about it. But then you listen to it. The lyrics, dude, the fucking, the opening track is called Death Wish. And it just, it hits you right in the fucking neck. It's just, it's so, have you ever loved a woman with a death wish? Something in her eyes, like flipping off a light switch, dude, I, whatever you, you, God damn it's, it's, so there's still greatness to be experienced in the future and going forward. And I, that's why I never want to just become inured to it. I don't want to wind up in a fucking cocoon built out of glow in the dark stuff from the eighties. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't, I don't want to view life through the prism I did when I was 10 years old, but it doesn't mean that I can't experience things now that when make me feel like I did when I first heard them when I was 10 years old or 15 or however old, you know what I mean? It's, I don't know if this is just wistful fucking because I'm going to be dead soon. And you're looking at your past in, in relation to your present and questioning your future as I think all of us should at this point. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I, I love it. I find myself discovering things. I, well, dude, all right. And fuck it. I will post this clip because it needs to be seen. There's so, there's so much forgotten because again, I, I found the cars, right? And I was watching a bunch of cars clips because YouTube is so perfect for this, this YouTube hole. So as much as we decry the algorithm, the algorithm will will do the right thing sometimes. Like if you watch four cars clips in a row, it'll start recommending things that you think you did, you, you might like, or it thinks you might like. So I watched a ton of like live cars stuff. And then I found there's a Benjamin Orr clip from 19, I think it's 98 and he's solo and he's playing in some bar. There, there might be 50 people there, but he has his own band and, and he still sounds like fucking Benjamin Orr. And I don't even know his story. I know he got cancer and died. I don't know if he was a drug dude. I don't know what happened with the cars. I got, you know, but this then makes me want to do the Wikipedia deep dive on that stuff and find out what happened. I have no idea. But Benjamin Orr still sounds like Benjamin Orr in this clip from 98 in front of 50 people in a bar. 
and does a full set list with a bunch of car songs. Then he does Stay the Night as an encore, you know, which was his solo hit. And I'm just shocked by it. Because, again, I saw, I go see, that's who I go see. Pat and I go see Yes or, or you know, uh, whomever you might see. or All these bands that don't have the same personnel. And, and to see Benjamin Orr in a bar, that would be a fucking amazing story. So as I'm watching all these Cars clips, I'm watching Pretenders clips, it starts to recommend. Because that's how I watched the Pretenders and it recommended the Cars. So then I started watching all the Cars stuff. Um And this is over the course of days, by the way. Please don't, you know, I'm not sitting there. Like one night I might be able to give a few hours to it, but some nights I'm, you know, I'll watch a a half hour or whatever and have to do something. But the algorithm knows. When you come back, the algorithm remembers. It's like Pepperidge Farm. It fucking remembers completely. It's like, ah, you know, you you like Milano's? Wow, Pepperidge Farm remembers you do. Also, you like Pretenders? Pepperidge Farm remembers. (laughs) So I... uh, I'm watching all these clips and then it recommends, you know, because I'm watching the cars, it recommends a a bar show and it's some, it says something like, it's all you, it's all I can do by the cars at a bar. And I was like, all right, well, I got to remember to watch that. So I just, in my brain, but I was like, yeah, I don't know if I want to watch some band because I didn't know who it was. It was like some band doing, and I'm like, whatever. So then I'm watching, like I said, I watch Tool, I watch these things. When I was watching Tool, it recommended Local H to me. Now, if you don't know who Local H is, uh, you should look them up. They had, their debut album had had two amazing, they had a hit with Bound for the Floor. And then there's another song that's actually better on, uh, you know, the, the whole album's good. I, I love the whole first Local H album, but there's a second song called High Five and Motherfucker. High Five and MF is what it's called. But it's, you want to talk about riffs and you want to talk about demonic fucking guitar that you feel in your liver. When high five motherfucker starts on, on the album, it's it's cause it starts with this like fucking real feedback. He kind of, and then it pivots into a I, I can't explain it. You have to hear it. If you hear the studio version, it fucking, it just, it's just evil. You high five and motherfucker. 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 I, I, dudes. And then it kicks into the fucking chorus. And it's funny with Local H, you can really, really hear their Nirvana influence in their sound. They, they just, it's just there. And also, Local H was two dudes. So that first album is so great, right? And then I kind of, it was it was the late 90s. So I mean, I lost track of guys. It wasn't even late 90s. It was the fucking early 90s. And I always call the 90s the decade I forgot because I got so into Pearl Jam and so into stand-up. You know what I mean? I just, and Jellyfish. Like, I, I just kind of, I and Van Halen put out some albums. I, I just kind of didn't do a whole lot of exploring new music back then because I had stuff that I like. I mean, Ice Cube, I was in Ice Cube, Hardcore, Cypress Hill, all these bands. So I was living with my brothers in the beginning, and then I wound up moving to L.A. later, and I was more concentrating on stand-up and getting my career going, and so I was also finding solace in the stuff that I had already known. It wasn't like I was out there constantly discovering new music, you know? And so the first Local H album was great, but then I, they fell off my radar. But then I, I saw a story about him a couple years ago, and their album, I forget what it was, their album came out around 9-11, like their second album or something, or their third album. Because, uh, yeah, that wouldn't be their second album. Whatever, they had an album that, that the record company loved, and it was going to be, you know, they, they really were excited about it, and then something happened to completely throw it off, where they were, like, I think, I think grunge went away or something, whatever the fuck, whatever you want to call it. But they wound up, so I read this article and they were just like, yeah, we were kind of stranded, like without a record label. And But, but he goes, this album is fucking great and it needs to be heard. So then I listened to the album and it's fucking fantastic. There's a song called All the Kids Are Right. And it's written from the viewpoint of a band who who uh, is falling apart. Uh, you know, you heard that we were great. I, but now you know we're lame because you saw the show last night. I mean, it's it's. I can't even, you know, whatever, I can't sing. But but what a great fucking pop song, but also heavy. And then the whole album was really good. So they were back on my radar. I threw them on my Spotify lists and stuff. It was cool. So when I was watching Tool, they recommended Local H for me. And so I went to look. There was a, a live clip of High Five and Motherfucker and a live clip of Bound for the Floor. And so I, I went for High Five and Motherfucker first because that's my song. 
Uh, and uh, and dudes, this is the clip I'll post. I'll close. I'll post this clip at least in the Joker's page. It is. It's a two man performance. I think there's got to be a bass player somewhere hidden, but maybe not because I can't. I don't really pick up the bass in the song on stage. It's a Cabaret Metro in Chicago. I think it's ninety eight. Packed. I mean, like that one of those shows where nobody can move wall to wall people on the floor and they're not stage diving, but they're all they're You know, people are sur- crowd surfing all over the place and they're just packed so tight and sweating. And he he starts the fucking song and live. It sounds even more malevolent and sinister, the fucking riff. And then he walks up to the fucking amps and he's slamming the like the guitar. Like he's making this feedbacky noise that I don't know how the fuck he did it. And the drummer is you can feel it in your fucking heart. He's he's just tearing it apart, and then he comes up to the microphone and he just you know you have five and and it and the crowds into it and and it builds this fucking crescendo, dudes. It is, it's one of the heaviest fucking things I've ever seen. And like like I said, it was one of the things where you watch it in your brain, you just go. I, when I post it, I'm literally gonna write, "Hey, did you want to kill somebody today? Make sure to watch this first, because it will it will make you want to run through walls. It'll make you." Go outside and fight God. I mean, it's it's like, dude, it's so fucking great. And so they're, like I said, they've been on my radar and I've watched these fucking clips and I love them. So the, the, I bring this back to you now because when I was watching the cars and it referenced there was a band doing It's All I Can Do in a in a bar. I was like, eh, I don't know if I'll watch this. And I was like, well, I, I love It's All I Can Do. So then I searched It's All I Can Do because there's no live version of the cars doing it. So I said, well, I'll watch this. And I turned it on and it turns out it's a guy, it's a band. It's, I'm sorry. It's a bar in Chicago and it's the lead singer of local H and Michael Shannon, the actor from nocturnal animals and fucking, you know, he's Zod and Superman and he's on stage with a fucking tambourine. And he brings up the guy from local H and they do. It's all I can do. They do bye bye love uh, and moving in stereo. And it's just, and it's this camaraderie, it's this feeling because it's a, you know, it's a fucking bar in Chicago. And so it's just a ton of fans and they know who he is. So like, whether they fell off the radar or not, the guys in Local H, whether the band didn't get the national success that they wanted or thought they deserved or quite frankly did deserve, he's he's a hero in Chicago. He still has diehard fans. I bet all the people that were at the Metro doing the fucking crowd surfing and stuff in 98 were props. Some of them were in this bar watching him with Michael Shannon. And he, you know, he, he just, they did the songs justice. It's this little band on stage and they're having fun and it's a packed place. And you know what? I don't, I don't go out as you know, I don't go to bars. I don't drink. I don't hang out. And also a lot of my friends are comedians. They have families, they do whatever. And I don't, I don't want to go to a comedy show and fucking hang out. And I, you know. But I, I do love live music, but I don't go see it at small clubs because, again, it's the same thing Baron says. I don't, you know, I don't want to make your struggle part of my night, you know, that, that sort of thing. But there is something fucking incredible about being in a room with a band that's tearing it up. Someone who's really fucking laying it down and you're, and you're in there experiencing it. It's, it's an amazing feeling. It's an amazing thing. And I will be honest with you, this clip, these clips of these, these guys doing these Cars songs felt like I was there. Like, it, it had this feeling of... Like you could almost smell the beer and, and, uh, and you know me, I don't drink. I'm not that guy, but it felt there was camaraderie cause they're joking around on stage and, uh, and to see, you know, Michael Shannon, I will, I will say this because I, um, you know, I was home in Chicago and I always say this is home now, LA, but then you go home and, and Chicago is incredible. And I, I will say this, I have regrets. I have real regrets that I never, you know, I didn't make it in Chicago. I started in Chicago. Um, and then worked the road and stuff, but I wasn't, I wasn't hanging out in Burton place with the other Chicago comics. I mean, I, once I got there, I just immediately started working and then doing road stuff and emceeing at the funny bones. So it wasn't like I was and play, and working zanies, you know, every, every couple of months I wasn't, I didn't hang out and do open mics in Chicago. I never did. I was, I was formed, you know, I, I did all that here in LA and I don't hang out with any of the guys I did it with here in LA, you know? And, and so I don't have anybody who's a touchstone for the early times, who, for the start of my career. You know, I have friends in Chicago like Mike Toomey and those guys who I knew. And, and look, I recognize this. This this may be putting you to sleep because this is just me talking about 
my my wistfulness for things that have gone by, you know, and I don't mean it to be that. And I apologize. I, I fuck that. I don't apologize. It's the show. It's what I do. I talk. Um, but being home, you know, my friends are in the suburbs. I never lived in the city. I never, I never got that experience and I'm, I miss it. And it's a great regret. It's something I should have done. I should have lived in the city, doubled up with a comic in an apartment. I should have gone and tried to do open mics. I should have done all that stuff and made friends there. And I didn't, I just started working the road and, and, even when we moved in 1997, Karen and I, we were deciding between New York and Los Angeles. And I, I was like, you know what? I could do a ton of stand-up in New York, but I didn't know a fucking soul. But in L.A., there was a fucking soft landing. I knew Pardo. Um, you know, I knew Pat. I knew Graham. I knew guys out here. And, you know, Pardo had helped us. He, he was willing to help us find an apartment when I came out. And all. I had a soft landing. There was a ton of people. And I regret that... I didn't have the balls to pull the trigger on going to a place where I was not known and try to make it happen. But that also gets back to the fact that, uh, you know me, I don't exactly, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not exactly pushing the envelope in form in, uh, in the category of effort, you know. So to go to a place where it looked like it was built in and everything was okay, then I, it was fine. And it was warmer. And I, I had already been in L.A., so I had an experience. I knew the clubs and stuff like that, so it was easier. And if you know anything about me, you know how I've always chosen chose easier, and uh, I regret it. You know, some mistakes. Um, so seeing this clip from the bar, it just it just looked like everybody was. Michael Shannon is a he's a Chicago legend. You know, he's an actor. Started there. He did plays. He went through the theater companies, and he's still Chicago, born and bred, still there. And he's a guy. He's in bars there. He's there all the time. He's in, he's you know, and that's that's admirable. That's a cool ass thing. Like I don't. You know, I'm not sure I have an identity. You know what I mean? And then going home this week and working, you know, it's, uh, it went, it, and it, Jesus Christ, I didn't even see what time it is. Um, <laughs> I, I tell you what, I'm going to do, I'm going to do another show. I'll cover all that stuff in another show. I'm not going to go into it now because there's like too much, but <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. But, but, but going home, it, was, it didn't, it didn't feel like going home really. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm no, and, and this has to do also with the fact that, you know, Lenny was coming home and they, they love Lenny. They really couldn't wait to see Lenny. Everybody wanted to see Lenny and I was there. And I'm not saying that in some boo hoo way. It's the truth. And also Lenny works his ass off. He publicizes himself. He tries to get people to go. He wants people to go. And I didn't tell anybody I was coming home. I mentioned it on the last show last time I was uh, uh, talking to you guys last week, but I didn't tell anybody. So even when I got home, you know, David and Kristen knew, but, but other, my other friends didn't know. And then they were like, Mike's here. Is he doing a show? Then, and Kristen's like, yeah, they go, we want to go. When is it? And I <laughs> brace yourselves. This will shock you. I can't imagine that any one of my friends would want to pay 30 bucks a ticket to go see me. It doesn't make any fucking sense. So that's why I didn't tell anybody. Cause I'm like, why would I, it just seems like me going, Hey man, you guys all want to spend $30 to talk to me when you could just come over here and talk to me. And, uh, but they want to support me. They want to see the show. They want to go out and have a good time with friends and some drinks and then watch me do comedy and, and see me. And, and I, it's so alien to me that thought in my head, but, and so I, I fucked up because I told David and Kristen, I go, look, I can comp you guys. I, I probably can't comp anybody else, but they were like, that's okay. They want to buy tickets. And I'm like, Oh Jesus. All right. Well, I, you know, I, I don't know if I can get them half price. They're like, no, they will buy tickets. Cause again, my friends own homes. They, you know, they own second homes, So they have the money, they can spend it and they want to spend it. But to me in my brain, I'm just like, that just seems like a, a big ask. And for them, they're like, no, just fucking tell us when you're here, dude. So, uh, Saturday when they wanted to come to the early show, it sold out and they couldn't get tickets. So David and Linda couldn't come. Uh, they all went to dinner. Like, so Ken and Sue had already bought their tickets and I got Dave and Kristen on the list. And then Craig and Mary, big guy and Mary were going to come and they wound up just going to dinner with Dave and Kristen. But then they came to the club just in case. And what another guy I went to school with a friend of Lenny's had a spare ticket. He gave it to Craig. And then when Craig was talking to the manager, he's like, yeah, we've known Mike 40 years. It's like, we're just here. And then he was like, oh well, yeah, we'll get you in. And then they, they all sat together, which was amazing. Um, but, but it was, it's funny. It was sold out. And, and if I had told them, so then I apologize. I sent texts. I'm like, look, man, I'm really sorry. I don't even. And they're just like, well, just tell us when you're here. And 
And it's this weird thing in my brain where I'm like, fuck, I, you know, nobody wants to fucking spend 30 bucks to see me, especially not my friends. I'm like, you could, you can come over on Saturday. We can watch football all day and have a pizza and laugh. And that'd be hilarious. And you don't have to spend 30 bucks in their brain. I'm sure they're like, we'd spend 30 bucks on pizza. Ass fuck. We want to see you do comedy. I don't know. Whatever. So I'm going to try to be better about that going forward because it was embarrassing that my friends wanted to come and see me. And they were like, why are you in town? And you didn't tell us. And I'm like, it's hard to explain to them. Um, because my brain tells me that you don't want to spend $30 to come see me. And, and what was funny is David was busting my ball. This made me laugh. David's busting my balls about it. Right. And he's just like, you know, why don't you tell people? And I go, because I, I can't imagine people would want to pay. And he goes, that's just dumb. And I'm like, I, I know, but that's just the way it is. I'm trying not to be that way. So then later on, uh, when Ken and Sue came over, uh, to meet them, to pick them up and go to dinner, they were like, uh, yeah, you got to tell us when you're in town or whatever. And I go, I know. I go, I just, to me, it's just ridiculous that people want to pay 30 bucks and whatever. And, uh, and Max made fun of me. He's just like, oh yeah, guys. Yeah. Nobody wants to see me or whatever. And I go, I go, dude, I go, says the guy who puts up a video of himself with a guitar and goes, hope I don't suck when you know you're a fucking genius. He's like, well, yeah, but I'd still tell people to come see me. I'm like, all right, <laughs> don't, don't, I said, believe me, you're just as sheepish as me. So don't pretend that you're not. Um, so yeah. So watching that clip maybe made me nostalgic for weirdly a life I've never had hanging out in bars, bonding with people, knowing them your whole life, you know? I have that to a certain extent, but not not the way I should. Not the way I should. Because again, even when I was on the road doing stand-up, I'd finish my set and go right to my room. I didn't hang out drinking because I don't drink. I didn't hang out with other comics. I did, you know, during the week. We went to lunch or whatever, but that late night bonding thing when you're after a show, I skipped it so much. I skipped it too much. And I again, these are all, I think this show is just going to be a tableau of regrets going forward. I should have done this. I should have done that. And by the way, when you get that, it's usually a precursor to the fact that somebody's dying. I will tell you, I have no tumors that I know of. My knee, again, I got a trick knee, but I have no idea. No, my knee's swollen up from driving so much. I know that. But I I, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't mean it to be this. But this is kind of where I'm at, you know, brain wise. So it kind of it finds itself. And also every when every day you're uncovering a new mistake. It's hard to keep it out of the narrative. So I I will do my best to still be entertaining or interesting. But please know that will also be uh, mixed in with uh, me going, Jesus Christ, why did I do that? Or holy fuck, why didn't I do that? Uh, because I'm feeling a lot of that very strongly and have been for years, quite frankly, a couple years, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's so yay. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Don't leave. <laughs> <clears throat> so watching these clips, they do the car songs. And uh, like I said, I already seen the local H stuff. So that's all in my algorithm. And then the algorithm, uh, puts another clip in and it says, uh, Scott, I forget his name. It's not Mitchell Martin, maybe the guy from local H and it says as Nirvana in 2016 for Halloween full show. So I clip on, I click on that and it's again, it's at a bar. It looked like it might've been the cubby bear. I don't know. It was a, it was a place again, place in Chicago and a lot of shows will do this. Like they'll, they'll do a special, like comedy does it now. There's comedians will come out and one guy will be Bill Hicks. He'll do jokes in the style of Bill Hicks. It's a whole show where people are masquerading as somebody else for Halloween. Well, this particular show that's on, it's an hour long. I don't think it's the full show, but again, it's a packed house and the camera's in the back of the room, but it doesn't matter because it gives you a, a, a much better scope of the floor. And again, it's a bar. It's a small bar. People are right on top of one another. And then the band comes out and they start, there's a ton of feedback. And I I sat there watching it mesmerized for an hour because uh, the musicianship was ridiculous. It was an unbelievably fitting tribute to Nirvana, who, you know, who I never saw, but I've seen clips of their live shows. Uh, But at the same time, if, if Nirvana was ever better than this band was in this clip, then you know what? more fucking power to him because these guys, and it's the dude from local H and he's, he was Kurt and it was great. They had a, they had a Chris Novoselic, they had a Pat smear and then they had a drummer, a uh, Dave Grohl and they blistered 
a Nirvana set list. I don't want to tell you what they did. I, I would prefer you went and watched it if you're a Nirvana fan or you're, or you're a fan of just hard rock or whatever. I'm telling you, it's a full hour show and it was... I, I was shocked by it because it, it was so... And the, the fans are going crazy. Like, the people are into it. And my favorite part is the fans know the words. So they're singing fucking songs. So imagine... Because there are, there are tribute bands, all right? A lot of times there's tribute bands and you're like, what the fuck? Uh, but I've seen them and it's an enjoyable night. I mean, I've seen the Atomic Punks. It's fun to see an old school Van Halen tribute band. I saw a Queen tribute band. They were real good. I mean, I've, I've done that kind of thing. Uh, but this is this was different. This wasn't some tribute band. This was some dudes paying homage to their influences and and doing it in the in the fucking most efficient and unbelievably explosive way possible because they just fucking kick out the jams from the jump and it's an hour of fucking they just hammer it. There's like a it's like a 5 minute break at one point as they're trying to figure out what song to do or tuning a guitar, but they never they never betray it either. They're never like ha ha look at us kind of wink wink nirvana da da. He he commits so fucking hard and i guarantee you it's because he went you know what this is a show in tribute to my fucking hero yeah it's fun yeah we're decorating ourselves or we're dressing up for halloween and this place it's a gimmick and whatever but this is my chance to channel my one of my great heroes and pay a tribute to him and it's when you watch it dude it's mesmerizing it's fucking mesmerizing and as you know um i i love greatness nirvana was fucking great you can't you can't argue. Uh, I love Local H. I think they were great. And then watching this to see the guy from Local H, who, again, when you watch the one clip, you'll see the Nirvana. Even when you hear the first album, you'll hear the influence. Even though I think it came out the same time, you know, like a year later maybe. So you can clearly see hear the influence. And I don't know if they just started in Chicago when when Nirvana was starting in Seattle. I don't know. Um, I don't know if they heard them. Who knows? Who knows? I you never know how the organism implants itself you never know how it grows and so somehow in their dna these guys had had nirvana and to see it come full circle in 2016 and have him on stage because also another thing you know again he in the interview i read he was kind of like Man, we missed it we we thought we had a thing and we we did really great work and it should we should have been bigger than we were quite frankly um in so many words so by 2016 he he himself no matter how much fun he's having, no matter what he does locally, he he still has to have those moments where he's like, fuck, we were close. We were so fucking close. And and then when you see the like I said, the live clips from ninety eight, and you're like, This is how good they are. This is they they tear a place apart. And you're going, Why wasn't this accepted? Why wasn't this honored? Why didn't this break through in the way that it should have? Um, and, and there are some who would say to me, you know what, it's when you watch this clip, uh, you can't move there in the Metro. I mean, there's so many people crowd surfing and they know, and they know the words. That's the best. They know the words to the songs. So, you know, he, they had a big fan base, certainly in Chicago. And, and so did they miss it? And this is the question all entertainers, this is the question all of us have, where I've said this before, I should be much bigger. I, I quite frankly, should have a bigger career. Um, but I know my all the poison that I injected into my own career. I know not, and again, it gets, I don't tell my friends when I'm in town. I don't, you know what I mean? I, I, I don't sell myself anywhere near the amount I should. I don't work nearly as hard as I should. I recognize all of these things to be true. And you know, everybody's like, well, it's not too late to do something about it. Yes, you're right. And I'm going to try to do something about it as best I can. But if I would have done something about it 20 years ago, maybe we're not having this conversation. And those are the thoughts that kill you. I, the, the, you know, I should have done this a long time ago. Yeah, you should have, but you can do it now. Yeah, I know. But if I'd have done it 20 years ago, yeah, but you didn't, you know what I mean? It's, it's all that thing where you're like, I, I, I should have been better. I could have been this. I could have been a contender instead of a bum, which I am. Uh, but I, I, I settled. I always settled. Even when I was writing on shows, I settled. I didn't work stand up. I should have worked it harder. Blah, 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 fucking blah, gunshot. You know this. So, uh, all I can do is try to be better going forward for me, for you, for all of us. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I will, <laughs> I always say that, but you know, I want to. And so I, I should, and, and, uh, see, those are qualifiers. I want to. You know, I should. 
Because if you say, I will, that means you'll do it. And, you know, who's to say? So uh, if you say, I will, you have to commit. If you say, I will. And, and also, talk is cheap. I've said, I will how many times? And then stepped on my dick. So it's it's the same reason I still have all my old fat guy jeans. <laughs> When I lost a ton of weight, I could have just fucking maintained. And then I was like, well, I'll keep these just in case. Well, there shouldn't be a just in case. You should have just fucking tossed everything and lived your life appropriately. Uh, You forecast your own demise and then slip nicely into it like a warm bath. Don't fucking do that anymore. Talking to me and you. Anybody who needs to hear that. You guys can get me at Mike at Mike Schmidt comedy dot com. And guys can be my friend at Facebook dot com slash the 40 year old boy. You can follow me at twitter.com slash the 40-year-old boy. Oh, is that X? X. Uh, <laughs> and then I'm in, a, I'm in a bunch of different places. I'm in. Uh, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Snapchat. I'm on uh, TikTok. I'm on Blue Sky. Good Christ. <laughs> follow me at all those places, please. I'm at um, Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok at Mike40YOB. And uh, I'm at Blue Sky at whatever Blue Sky the fuck uh, Mike 4 OYLB. So I'm, it's the same. You just got to find it. It's the same, but different. You just got to find it there. Uh, oh, fuck. There was this thing I was going to say. There was a whole... I just remembered. Holy shit. All right. Do I do it now? Uh, you know, I'll do it at the end. Whenever the end is. Who knows? Uh, all right. So there you go. So uh, you guys can get me at Mike at MikeSchmidtComedy.com. Be my friend at Facebook.com slash the 40-year-old boy. Why I said all this. Uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. What has happened to this young man? Uh, he's fooling himself, but he don't believe it. All right. He's killing himself, but he don't believe it. It's terrible. Uh, did you know I'm part of the Misfit Toys Co-op? I just dropped a pen. I am. Did you know that? It's true. Misfit Toys Co-op. It's never not funny. It's Doug Loves Movies. It's the Todd Glass Show. It's... Is I don't it, look. I have to be honest. I've not been invited to the meetings. Not that there's meetings, but I I don't know. All I know for sure is that mental illness happy hour with Paul Gilmartin, and Jesus Christ Duck with uh, Danielle and Christine. Those are shows that belong to the Misfit Toys Co-op, along with Never Not Funny. I'm not sure if Doug or Todd or Jen still do, um, but if they do, go listen to them. And I'll tell you what: even if they don't listen to them, they're great people. Doug's a nice guy. Todd's one of the best. I like Jen a lot, so go listen to their shows too. But also, mainly listen to Never Not Funny. And uh, Paul Paul Gilmartin, my great friend. And then also the lovely and talented uh, Danielle and Christine with their show. Go listen to all of those things. I'm, I'm a little distracted right now. I don't know why. You know uh, why? I'll tell you why I'm distracted. Uh, <laughs> you're going to laugh. I didn't talk about a fucking thing I planned on talking about. I literally... I. I was going to tell you about Chicago and shows and stuff, and and I we wound up uh, you know elsewhere, so that's fine. You know what? I'll I'll cover it soon. <laughs> um, all right. So find me at those places. Follow me, and there's the Misfit Toys Co-op show. Uh, what else is there? Oh, we have podcasting friends. I can tell you about that. Our great friend, Fearful Jesuit, runs the Paranoid Strain podcast. You can check that out. He has uh, finally bookended and closed out his. Long run on, or no, or is he reopening a long run? I don't look. I don't know. Here's the thing. I'm I I love him and his show, and you need to check it out. Okay, don't listen to me because maybe here's the thing. If I give you guys too much information, then you're just like, oh, uh, why do we need to listen? Well, I don't want to do that. I'm going to give you a tease. I'm going to give you all oh, the prestige and the glory. Another human interest story. You are that. That's tattooed love boys which is another fucking riff that'll murder you, as mentioned earlier in the show. Uh, I, although I will tell you this, Tattooed Love Boys, amazing song by Pretenders, fucking just vicious. And I love the riff. I love the song. And uh, I just, like I said, I had a deep dive on Chrissy Hind. If you can find, you want to find this on YouTube, it was on a box set. She covered Creep by Radiohead Acoustic, Pretenders did. And it's it's gorgeous. It is it is crystalline. It is so beautiful. And uh, it is as beautiful as an ocean sunset. I just, she's so good. Uh, but I will tell you this in doing this deep dive, I found out she had a, a memoir and I did not know this. And then this person mentioned that, uh, tattooed love boys is, uh, it's written about a sexual assault that she experienced 
And I'm like, oh, man, I fucking loved this song for 43 years. And now I find out the trauma associated with it. But also she's that's who she is. She puts she puts herself and her trauma and stuff into her music. And she also said, I was shocked to hear this. I'll just end. Look, I'm not going to go into it. But she was like, she takes responsibility for that sexual assault. Because apparently some bikers were like, give us your quaaludes. And she said no. And then they kind of dragged her into an abandoned building. And one of the songs from the song is... Uh, one of, the, one of the lines from the song is uh, stop sniveling. You'll make some plastic surgeon a rich man. And uh, somebody said that to her. She remembers that being said to her, hey, you're going to make a plastic surgeon rich if you don't whatever. And uh, Jesus Christ, is that haunting and uh, still a fucking jam, an amazing song. But also knowing that it is birthed out of real pain. That's uh, boy, that's a tough ask sometimes, you know, but that's what art is birthed out of real pain. Uh, just lying there in its own placenta waiting for you to discover it. <laughs> uh, well, oh, Paranoid Strain. Hey, that's a podcast. You should check it out. It's super good. I don't know about placenta. There might be some of that there. Uh, th- you know, this is true. This happened while I was in Chicago. Um, and I wound up doing it on stage because I, someone was talking to me because I had, I had mentioned something about my ma on stage I, I, or, or somebody. No, I was talking to my, about my ma off stage. And somebody was like, oh, my God, my mom's crazy. I go, oh, really? And they go, yeah, oh, she wants to use uh, the Christmas china for Thanksgiving. And I'm telling her, ma, you can't do that. It's just, it's just, you know, my, it's just, it's why just wait a month. Why not wait a month? She's so crazy. And I was like, wow, that is crazy. You know, when my mom had her first cancer surgery, while she was under sedation, she confessed to a murder. She didn't mention plates, though, so you still got me there. Uh, that's how I delivered it on stage. But, uh, but off stage, I was like, really? I go, my mom, cause off stage, I just went, really? My mom confessed to a murder <laughs> after she mentioned the plates thing. And everybody looks at you like, uh, <clears throat> and then, and then they're like, ha ha comedian. Ha ha ha. And I'm like, oh yes. Hilarious. Ha ha ha. Uh, oh, you know what it was? Cause the first night, one of the, maybe, I forget one of the nights I talked about moving from Chicago and someone was like, are you from here? And I said, no, I'm actually from Bolingbrook. I lived in the Chicago for a while, but then my, my dad tried to break my mom's arm and we had to move. I said that on stage because I am learning the difference between podcast mic and stand up mic. You know what stand up audiences are not expecting podcast mic. Uh, they're expecting stand up mic to do jokes and lines and bits. Uh, what I have to do is be the best version of myself and combine the two podcast mic and stand up mic. Now, you know how you do that? By working hard and making it uh, as your your life's goal. You know how you don't make that work? By doing stand-up once a year. So do I have a plan going forward? Well, I mentioned that earlier. How dare you forget I mentioned the plan? Weren't you on board with the plan we talked about earlier? I thought you were, god damn it. Uh, <laughs> all right, so the Prayer Night Stream podcast is amazing. It's got our great friend, Fearful Jesuit. It's got the lustable, Day and Danny Unicorn is lustable a word? I don't know if it is. Uh, and also respectable. She's a she's a lovely and talented person. But I'm just assuming from her voice that she's someone you would want to go round and round with, which probably I shouldn't be saying out loud again. I have to backtrack. Uh, I'm sure someone's going to write me now and go, oh, my God, what happened to you? I don't know. You know, I, that's another thing. I, just, I keep trying to say stuff and then go, don't say that. What if I said this? Don't say that. How dare you? Here's a joke I did in Chicago. No, I won't do it. Because uh, I, when I when I thought of it, honestly, in my brain, I was like, uh, it's because it's a nothing. It's a throwaway joke. It's funny. But I was like, someone's going to get upset at this, but I don't, whatever the fuck. Uh, so now I have to do it because I told you it. Uh, it was a tag on a bit. And believe me, when I described to you, you know what? Fuck no. I'm going to wait. How about that for a tease? Now, the next show, I'll talk about what I did in Chicago and I'll tell it then. And you'll, and you'll be so thrilled because it works in context there. If I do it now, you're going to be like, what the fuck? You'll, well, you'll still fucking laugh because it's funny. But in the, in the, when it's part of a crazy quilt of experiences, then you'll go, okay, this is part of the rubric of his material. But if I just spit it out now, like I just spit out the fucking China joke, which was real. Uh, all right. The Paranoid Strike podcast. <laughs> go check it out. Danic Unicorn is fantastic. Fearful Jesuit is uh, learned and knowledgeable and smart and terrific. They are wonderful and they they need your attention. They deserve it. So go check it out. The Flem Cat Podcast. Well, let's talk about that right now. The Flem Cat Podcast is our great friend, David Hernandez. He's uh, he's doing it. And uh, this this week's episode. Well, what the fuck? You'll find me on there, Pilgrims. That sounded like John Wayne. Well, what the fuck, Pilgrim? You'll find me on there, you will. 
Is that you, John Wayne? Is that me? What movie is that from? I bet you don't know. Um, and I put that here at the end because I know somebody will be like, I, ah, if, well, this is a test if anybody listens to the end if they identify what I just said. Uh, the Flemcat podcast. <clears throat> it's terrific. I was on it. And uh, you're going to hear a lot of that Yes and Rick Springfield thing, I think. I believe we talked about that uh, as David was, you know, saying that no one should ever do music ever again if they can't if they have to tune their guitars down a notch i don't know man <laughs> not a musician so what do i know uh i mean i could be that judgmental about comedy and comedians i suppose uh I, I don't know if you've seen there's a oh my goodness there's a young gentleman out there right now who just had a netflix special and everyone is up in arms oh my goodness the the apple cart has been tipped over as as this young man is planting his flag in the world of comedy and having great success and now uh Oh my goodness, they're trying their best to cancel him because of the things that he said. And I, I don't fucking understand anybody ever. I don't. I don't. I've got news for you. If you have a television, it comes with a remote. And on that remote, there are two buttons. If you must watch a special, but you don't want to be offended, you can hit the mute button. M-U-T-E looks like a speaker with a line through it. Or even better, even better, there's a channel changing button that means you don't have to tune into the special at all and let people who like him or the things he talks about go ahead and watch that special. It has nothing to do with you. The world doesn't cater itself to you and your whims and your tastes because there are probably things that you like that other people don't like and you wouldn't force them to watch them or experience them, would you? I don't think you would because you want to be a good person. You're kind to animals, good to kids. Why not let people live their lives and you can live the life you want to lead? Mute button, channel changing button are right there on your remote, remote, remote. Uh, so a lot of people are very upset and, and good for them. And I, I, I can't get tuned up about this kind of thing. No, I, I get, look, I get plenty mad about plenty of things. Uh, but as you know, for me, comedy is a bit sacrosanct, sacrosanct sacrosanct uh because if anything if you're funny it excuses everything and if you're not funny people will decide but uh, that's the problem is there are people who also who do think that person's funny like i had a, i was talking to somebody and they're like uh i can't believe this you know i thought he was this way and now he's this way and i'm like yeah but he's clearly made a decision that this is the crowd he wants to cultivate this is where the money is well you know there was money in the other one too he didn't have to do this well but maybe this is who he is maybe maybe he was the trojan horse of comedy uh, or maybe he, which probably maybe he's the Magnum Trojan horse of comedy. I don't know what the guy's packing, but he's got an eight pack. I mean, you know, look, if you're promoting your comedy special with a black and white photo of you in a white tank top pulled up with your eight pack and cum gutters showing, well, guess what? Who do you think you think that guy's going to be doing a lot of <laughs> introspective material? Uh, no, he's not. He's going to be talking a whole lot about, you know, whatever the fuck he talks about. And I don't know. I, I, this this never ending fusillade of people coming after everybody is just silly now and look i don't agree with everything these people are saying the comedians or whatever the fuck but there's plenty of comedians you like out there go watch nate bargatze he's a fucking genius go watch that guy put him in your veins go watch brian regan he's a fucking miracle berbiglia has got a new special out watch that uh, the Flem cat podcast is out there it's our great friend david and i'm on it this week as i said we're talking about a bunch of cool stuff about bands and uh, Mike Ruzioni, and uh, it's fun. You should check it out. It was a lot of fun to be up there in the old Mexi Park. I, you know, I keep sometimes deferring to call it the Cat House because he he called it the Cat House for the longest time, but now upstairs. Well, I think the Cat House is downstairs and Mexi Park is upstairs. And man, he's got some cool ass shit in in the fucking Mexi Park. He's got a metal sculpture that says Mexi Park above the door, dude. It's fucking beautiful. All of his stuff is beautiful, and he had. He was working on it. He had a Gene Simmons painting he had just done that looked fucking incredible. I, he's, he is truly the most talented fucking person I have ever met. It is a crazy thing. And you know, but what's really funny is, you know, who's about to surpass him? My godson. My godson can fucking do anything. Max tells me all the time. He's like, it's ridiculous. He's leaving me in the dust, which is Max being humble because Max is incredible. Uh, he had a fat, a new fat belly guitar that was pretty neat, super heavy. It was it just, I love my friend. And it it makes me incredibly happy to see him so happy living the life he wants to lead, surrounded by his guitars and his basses and his paints 
and uh, and a loving family that he he had a major hand in making a loving family and raising a beautiful wife. What a fucking success story! God damn it! I don't. I'm not saying that in a mean way. I'm saying it's awesome. He's an amazing success story, and I and I just fucking love it. So it was great to see him and spend time there. I, I, I truly enjoyed it, and I was on his show. So I think it'll, you'll hear it in the context of the Flemcat podcast. Go download it now wherever your finer podcasts are sold or procured. Same thing with the guys over there at the old Paranoid Strain. Check it out. That's Fearful Jesuit and the lovely and talented Dana Unicorn and any number of dry experts who we have to hear a tape of as fearful for some reason gives up the microphone. But if I had that voice, I would never give up the microphone. If I was fearful Jesuit and I had that fucking those dulcet tones, that timber, I'd be the only one talking. I wouldn't even let Dana. I'd, I'd, she might be able to get one word in edgewise, but I'd, I would be like, hey, listen to me. I, people came here to hear my syrup pouring out of the bottle because that's what it sounds like. It sounds like you're just pouring maple syrup right into my ears when he talks. What a fucking voice. Love it. Uh, hey, who wants to hire me for something? You? Is it you? Look to your right. Is it you? Look to your left. Is it them? No, it's you in the middle. Um, I'm on Cameo. And uh, it's funny. I just did a Cameo for my great friend, Manny Mo. He's a lovable guy. He, he booked me for one. He's the king of kings. I always say this about him. He booked me for a uh, Cameo while I was in Chicago. And then I looked at it, and it was more of a pep talk for me, I think, than it was a uh, a, a pep talk or a pep talk for him. It was it was it was Manny Mo finding another way to help me out financially while also giving me some cool advice. And uh, he's just the best. He's a super cool guy. So thank you, Manny Mo. You're amazing. And like I said, you know, in the in the throes of my madness, when I was staring at the microphone as if it were made of cancer, he he stepped up his Patreon in a way that he did not have to. And he's just a, a he's been around from the beginning. You know, I remember when I met him at the first Podfest. We talked in the hallway, and I just was like, "This dude is is just an incredible and kind, wonderful gentleman." So, thank you, Manny Mo, for doing that. Uh, he hired me for a cameo. So, here's the thing: if you want me to say that you're a kind and wonderful gentleman or lady, as the case may be, why not hire me to do a cameo? You can get the cameo app on your phone. That's a big deal. Go ahead and drop that uh, there, or or get this: you can get the uh, cameo app. Uh, or you can go to bookcameo.com and uh, and do it through there. And uh, look, there's I don't think there's a lot of Mike Schmitz on there. Also, I think I'm one of the cheapest dudes. Like because they were this made me laugh. There's a Black Friday special, which is fucking Oh, by the way, happy Thanksgiving. This will be you'll be getting this on Thanksgiving morning. I don't know when you'll listen to it, but <sighs> smells like Thursday here right now, but that's because it's Wednesday night. Um but by tomorrow, oh the smells. Oh the smells. I'll be going to my brother's house for some special Thanksgiving nonsense, going out there for cooking and pies and football. And I'm uh, I'm going I'm going to experience every moment of it. I'm going to go early. Uh, and then Friday, I'm going to see a buddy of mine and watch football at his house. It's going to be totally fun. Me and Mac, or me and uh, Lenny are going to take a drive down. A guy named Larry Swick, who uh, I've told stories about here on this podcast. Larry Swick. I grew up with him in Romeoville. He was the guy who, uh, when he broke up with girls, he would give them a pink slip. In seventh grade. <laughs> and I believe he slapped Gina Fermella in the face with a glove. God damn it, Larry. Uh, well, anyway, we've, we've reconnected, and it's so cool to have him in my life. And so I'm going on to his place on Friday because he's a Miami Dolphin fan. We're going to watch his team because he's come up here a few times to see the Bears. And it's like, why don't we go down to his place? So we're going to do that. Uh, but I hope your Thanksgiving is amazing. Well, I'll talk about this on the way out. What the fuck? Why would I do that? Um, so happy Thanksgiving. There you go. Um, but I'll get to it later. But so Cameo has a Black Friday deal. And it makes me laugh all the time where they're like, hey, man, you should totally get in on the Black Friday deal and cut your prices so people hire you. And it's like, I right, look, my price is bottom of the fucking barrel, especially with the fees you take and the taxes in California. Like there's already an Apple takes a fee. It's it's crazy. I've talked about it on here. Like I, I did a Cameo, I got 12 bucks. I it was at 20 and I got 12 bucks. So I had to bump it to 25 because otherwise, you know, what's the point? So, but there, that makes me laugh that they are always like, Hey man, it's like when you go to these stores now, you ever go to a fucking store and they're like, you know, it's, you know, your total is 1940. Do you want to round it up to 20 to help? I don't know. Some fucking kid in Ecuador or whatever the fuck. No, why don't you do it? You're a giant fucking company. Tell Jack to get out of his box and send some fucking money. Not me. You go to Walgreens, the same deal. You know, Oh, your total is 1711. Do you want to round it up to $18 so you can help somebody who's blind? No, no offense to the blind guy. I think he's great. But sadly, I'm at a point in my life where I need 89 cents. So I, you know, perhaps when I'm blind, I'll feel differently. 
But also these giant fucking companies keep, they keep reaching out to the people to go. It's not like a thing where they go, we'll match it. Or they say, oh man, you know, we'll, we're giving a million. Do you want to tack onto that? It's always like, hey man, you want to help? Hey, you want to do this? Like it, it's a trick. It's a weird Jedi mind trick to make you think they're being charitable, but you're the one who's giving the money. It's fucking crazy to me. Uh, and again, I want to help people. I'll do what I can to help, uh, you know, well, whomever, anyone, anyone who needs my fucking help. If I have the means of the capacity, I will absolutely help you, but I will do it. I don't need to go through Sears. Nobody, nobody wants Sears to be my agent of change. You know what I mean? And I don't even know if fucking Sears is still open. That's how fucking old I am. It's I, you know what? I'm going to go through Zare. <laughs> every old store. Hey, look, I want to help the homeless. I want to help everybody I can, but I don't want to go through venture. <laughs> Just keep naming old, old stores. That's kind of fun. Oh yeah. I, you know, I got no problem helping the homeless. If somebody needs help, I will help them. If somebody needs me to go ahead and step up for them, I will step up for them, but I will do it personally. I don't need to do it through circuit city. <laughs> every store that's bottomed out, even though they stole money from people for charity. God damn it. Uh, all right. So I, I don't like that trickery, that chicanery where they're like, Hey man, you want to give us a few extra cents so we can send it to a dog who's sad? No, I don't. No offense to a sad dog. I want to pet him, but Jesus fucking Christ. I don't think sad dog is going to go like, Oh, thanks Mike. No, he's gonna go. Thanks. Walgreens. He thinks you fucking did it. Um, and that's my point with cameo. They've got a black Friday special that I'm not involving myself in because they're like, Hey man, you should cut your prices. So more people hire you. It's like, I shared 25 bucks. I just told you my friends want to pay 30 to come see me. If somebody doesn't want to pay 25 bucks for a fucking five minute video message, I don't know what the fucking tell you. I shouldn't be on your platform. But I don't want to say that out loud because they'll fucking bump me from their platform. Uh, oh, what was the, what else did it say in the note? Oh, they said we can lower everybody's prices according like, like we could, and cause it's a form letter. It's not just to me. Right. And I'll say stuff like we can go down to the bargain basement prices of like $20 or $30. And I'm like, I'm 25 all the time. Quit reminding me how, how close I am to bargain basement. All right. It's, it's bad enough when I know it myself. I don't, you rub it in my fucking face. I just read a, uh, <laughs> a New York times expose of cameo. And I look, I don't want to get into it too much. I don't want to talk too much about stuff that makes you sad or them upset or them kick me off the platform that we discussed earlier. <laughs> but again, they were a startup that, and again, I, the only reason I got in there is because my friend knows the guy who owns it. I have a buddy that, you know, I, I, a comic from Chicago is no longer a comic. He's a very successful fucking tech guy or, you know, finance guy. I don't want to say whatever, but he's doing very well. And he happened to know the guy who started this company a million years ago. And he's like, hey, man, I got a buddy who's a comedian. So I was one of the first fucking idiots on the platform, I think. And now it's this exponentially growing business. Well, if you read the New York Times, they did what every growing startup does. They bought a fucking house that made it the headquarters. And then they were spending money on parties and all sorts of crazy shit. And then they bought smaller companies and tried to whatever they did. They did all that dumb shit because, they, again, your whole business is predicated on the fact that people want Ralph Melf to give them a phone call. I, that just doesn't seem like a solid business plan. I don't know if you go into a bank and you're like, here, hear me out. This is what I'm going to tell you. This is what people want. People want the fifth lead from Will and Grace and his Bichon Frise to talk sassy into a telephone. That's what they want. Give us money. It just seems weird, right? It's, it's a, like all internet stuff. It's just some electronic tumbleweed that eventually is going to blow out of sight. And it, whenever, like, whenever I say that, I go like, if there's some company you own on the internet and it's valued at a big amount of money and people come in sniffing around to buy it, sell it instantly, sell it fucking instantly, because then you'll have a ton of fucking money. And if you want to think of another dumb idea, you can, but I guarantee you right now, there's some 11 year old kid who's got a better idea than you. And he's going to crush you in two years. So fucking sell, sell, sell. But the cameo guys are just, you know, hanging on for dear life because there's, they figure, I guess, you know what? There's always work at the post office and there's always someone out there who wants to hear from Dennis Rodman. So good, good for them. And I'm not lowering my prices for black Friday, but I'm here. If you want me to talk to your family about black Friday, if you want me to talk to you, if you want me to give you a pep talk, if you want me to give you the pep talk that Manny Mo gave me, I'm happy to do it. Hire me at cameo book cameo.com or the cameo app available on your phone. If you go to Mike Schmidt comedy.com, uh, there's a, a horn boy in the upper right hand corner. If you click on that, what are you going to do? You're going to click on that. What are you going to do? You're going to click on that. And then after you click on that, 
Uh, a PayPal thing will come up and you can send me some dough. Why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you reach out, reach out and touch someone? Why wouldn't you reach out, reach out and just say thank you? I'm the new AT&T commercial. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and send me, uh, if you want to do that. And look, you can make a monthly recurring thing on PayPal or you can just send me dough. Whatever you want to do. It is the holiday season. <laughs> what a scumbag. Uh, there's also Patreon.com, Patreon.com slash Mike. 40YOB it's out there it's ready for you to jump in and join and uh will there be something on the Patreon this week i know you're like what there will be it's just uh it's going to be in a couple of days i'm trying to figure cuz i'm waiting i'm waiting on some emails uh but yeah yeah cranking up the old patreon machine like i said man goals plans uh i wa- i'm not i want to i will okay we'll make 2024 the year of i will uh, but, and now you're like, but Mike, we're at the end of 2023. Ah, ha, ha. There's the rub. That gives me a six weeks to not do it. <laughs> Jerk. That's not the case. I'm doing whatever I can to be the best I can. So please uh, remember that. Uh, cameo, Patreon, PayPal over there at the website, paranoid strain, phlegm cat. Oh, no, I, I have channels. Did you know I have channels? I do. I have some channels, uh, youtube.com slash the 40 year old boy mentioned the YouTube hole. Uh, I don't know what the anagram, the anagram, <laughs> the, you know what the word anthology and anagram are in my head right now? Algorithm. Jesus fucking Christ. My head was like anagram and the, and the algorithm. No, the, uh, anthology, whatever the fuck, who cares? There's uh the algorithm. If you, I don't know if you watch a bunch of my shows, I don't know what it'll tell you. I'm sure there's some other jerk out there talking to a microphone. It'll refer. Uh, but if you go to youtube.com slash the 40 year old boy, and here's the thing, just go there and subscribe. Because it keeps my numbers in a decent spot. And uh, as I've mentioned, like I said, with goals and plans, planning on some YouTube stuff, and that can be monetized and whatever the fuck, and you don't care about money, and I don't blame you, but at the same time, I have to eat. Uh, I got to keep buying eggs and yogurt, friends. Remember it was before, it was uh, yogurt and bananas and toast. Now it's uh, eggs and yogurt and uh, whatever the fuck else I can find. Uh, YouTube.com slash the 40-year-old boy. Go ahead and subscribe, and we'll see how uh, that shakes out. <laughs> Twitch.tv slash the 40-year-old boy. Now, I did a stream from Chicago. Like I said, I would. It was only about 45 minutes. Me eating some Chicago snacks, which were fun. Um, I have not tried. I've only been home for like a day and a half. So I, I haven't tried the, uh, the, the, the Twitch to see if it works from the computer yet. I will run a dry run. It's the holiday here, so I probably won't be doing it. Uh, but again, with my schedule now that I've, I've, I'm, I do have a window for twitching every day. Uh, so that's the plan going forward. I just need to make sure that it works. And when I do that, I'll announce it in the discord. If you want to sign up for that, that'd be cool. But uh, twitch.tv slash the 40 year old boy. Another thing that you can just go follow. That would be great. And eventually I will be on there playing games and talking to you once again, eating strange chips and popcorn, whatever I've got handy. I'll shove it right in my mouth on camera. Won't you love that? I think you will. Uh, so twitch.tv slash the 40 year old boy, youtube.com slash the 40 year old boy. Do me a favor, go and subscribe to the both of them. That would be great. Uh, well, I would say this twitch.tv subscribing costs money. Like you can subscribe with your Amazon prime and it gets me five bucks a month. You got to renew it every month. Uh, or you can just follow it. If you follow me at twitch.tv slash the 40 year old boy, like I said, it just keeps my numbers in a decent place and we're, we want to bring them up of course. And youtube.com slash the 40 year old boy. I have to be over a thousand to monetize. And I think I am still, I don't know if anybody left me behind, but who knows, but it can't hurt to have you sign up. So go ahead and sign up and I don't spam you. It's not like I'm like, Ooh, YouTube. If you have notifications on, on your phone, it'll tell you if I put something up, but I'm not fucking constantly in your ear. I promise. I'm not going to be in your ass about this all the fucking time. Cause that's just silly. Um, and the, you know, so now I remember the thing I wanted to talk about, and this doesn't make sense to, to tell you later. Uh, the, one of the whole things I was talking about, about when you were, you see these bands from a million years ago. And then I watched Aerosmith. I'm like, fuck. Um, and then I started to talk about Van Halen and I got sidetracked. Well, Van Halen, um, some of the members of Van Halen last week announced that they're going to tour this year, next year, 2024. And this is a, this was a, a grouping that was always threatened, but never took place. But it's Sammy Hagar, Michael Anthony, and they're bringing along Jason Bonham on drums. And they're also bringing uh, Joe Satriani. Now, Sammy Hagar used to have a band called Chicken Foot and it was Sammy Hagar. Michael Anthony, Joe Satriani, and Chad uh, Chad Smith from the uh, the Chili Peppers on drums. I actually saw them. You might remember by year, whatever the fuck. Me and Pat saw them at the fucking whiskey. With and again, just like the Metro, we were all on top of one another. But now they're bringing Satch out and Jason Bonham's the drummer, and they're going to do Van Halen songs. And he said, like they announced it on Howard Stern, the whole band showed up, 
and they're treating it like a real big deal. Okay. And Sammy invited Dave to show up for some of the shows if he wants to come out and do a couple of songs. But Sammy also alluded to the fact that they're going to do Sammy songs. You know, he said, we're going to celebrate the whole Van Halen catalog. So I would assume they're going to do some, some of the Dave stuff. Now, all of that sounds like a good idea. Satriani's amazing. Michael Anthony still can hold his own on the vocals. Jason Bonham's an incredible drummer. The problem is Sammy Hagar, I think, is 76 years old now, and his voice is fucking gone. Gone. And there were all these people who were excited for this announcement, and they're like, yeah, you know why? Nostalgia. You know why? They, they, there are people who still go see Sammy at Cabo Wabo. There are all these people who love this, and that's their thing, and that's fine. I'm not going to tell anybody what they can and cannot love. But I saw right now, the song right now, their, their, their performance of it on Howard Stern. And uh, the music was a little iffy. The drum sounded great because Bonham had like some electric kit. And Satriani is a fucking miracle on guitar, but he doesn't sound like Eddie. But he's he can play. He, even he said the challenge is the learning the full catalog. And Eddie was so improvisational and did fun stuff on stage. So I got to try to be that guy. Um, but they start doing Right Now, which is an amazing song. And then the, when the band kicks in, it's like really good. And then Sammy sings and dudes. You want to talk about turning it down a couple of keys or a couple of registers. He's like, don't want to wait. Cause it's, you know, it's don't want to wait. I can't even describe it. It's, it's, it wasn't good. And he, and then he, I think he even knew it. Cause he kept saying stuff like, Hey man, this is like our first rehearsal. So, you know, we're just, we're just getting it out there with like, you could tell that he knew he didn't sound good in just the clips I saw. And I have not seen anything except two minutes of right now. And then I turned it off. I don't want to see the rest because just seeing Sammy, I winced. I was like, Oh man, but here's the thing that made me laugh. He posted it on all the social media. It was a big announcement. Like, they're, they're making it a big tour. They're already selling tickets for the summer. They're going to be all over the place. And all these people, again, because they're buying their nostalgia, they're like, I bought the tickets. Oh, my God, I can't wait. It's going to be so exciting. Oh, man, fucking Van Halen. You know, maybe Dave will show up because you offered out the invitation. And then Dave was like, let's do this. But Dave's going to show up and be a jag off. It's going to cause an issue. I know it is. But even worse, uh, the comments that I saw online, there were people who were like, this is going to be great. But you know what, man? Satriani, he really needs to change his tone. And there were, and there were multiple people. It wasn't just one people, one person. It's multiple people who were like, you know, Sat should buy some of the EVH, like the Wolfgang PV uh, amp, and he needs to change his tone. Like there's a pedal he can use and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, are you really, really going to tell Joe Satriani? It's bad, it's bad enough, okay, that they're essentially doing a Van Halen cover band thing. There's nothing wrong with that. I got no issue with it, but that's who they are. And that's what it's it just, you know, Satch and Jason Bonham are along for the ride. Sammy and Michael were in Van Halen, but you're going to tell Satch, Joe Satriani, who's an, an, an incredibly successful solo artist. And is just doing this because he wants to hang out with his friends for the summer that he doesn't sound enough like Eddie Van Halen for you. Are you fucking serious? And again, just the, the balls, the sheer gall you would have to type that. Like, again, in Sammy's feed on his page. You know, you got to tell Satch he needs to do this. He really needs to sound more like Eddie if you're going to do this. It's like, man, can't you just be fucking happy? You know, and again, Sammy's 76, man. You're you're lucky he's going to do this fucking tour. And I will say this about Sammy, too. If you've seen Sammy recently, he is leaning into surfing Bay Area 76-year-old. Because it's a lot of slides on his feet, a lot of gray beard. He doesn't shave. His hair is never, I mean, you know, it's just a mop of fucking hair. But he just, and he's he's fucking, what's the word I'm looking for? Not beefy. Huh. He's, that's swollen. He, he's, you know, he's an old man. And he's a little, he's not, he's always been kind of cherubic, all right? But he was a fighter, so he would run and he'd worry about his weight and all that stuff. Well, now he he looks like a guy at the end of the bar. And it's like, dude, this you, half of the battle on this is you can't because he's turned into a Buffett. You know, that's his deal. He's like a Buffett guy who goes out, steps on a flip flop. Everybody gives him money, whatever the fuck he wants to do. Just like Kenny Chesney's going that route. Barefoot radio, whatever the fuck. Good for you guys. There's a lot of believe there's it's it's the same thing I mentioned with that comedian I mentioned. There's there's crowds of money and they've got people to spend and you just go there and they're gonna give you dough. Piles of it. So Sammy's leaned into that whole Cabo Wabo Cantina. This drink's on me. Ha <laughs> ha. They got a bar on stage, all that kind of shit. Good for him. 
But at the same time, if you're going to do this and you're going to go out with these songs, and I know I sound like the guy telling Satriani to get a pedal, but maybe Hagar shaves. Maybe he tries to look at least a little presentable because, boy, oh, boy, does he look like a fucking hobo these days. I mean, he's on Howard Stern. You can see the clips on YouTube, and you're looking at him, you're just like, dude, man, you, you should have at least run a Gillette across your face because you just look like you wandered in from the street. But who am I to presume that, buddies? I'm a mess. Uh, all right, so that's what I wanted to talk about was the fact that Van Halen's going out next year. Not really. Two of, two of the guys from Van Halen, and they're going to do a bunch of Van Halen songs, and uh, I, you know what? Good luck. <laughs> I want to go. If I can get in free, I'll go. I don't think I'm going to pay for a ticket, but uh, but after I heard Sammy sing right now, I'll tell you this, I'm definitely not paying for a ticket because it was fucking grim. So <clears throat> a lot of miles on that voice. But again, when you're doing the hey, man, let's all drink tequila and who cares and letting the crowd sing every third or second line, then you can get away with that. But these Van Halen fans are persnickety jagoffs, as indicated by the fact that they're telling Satriani what pedals and chords to buy for his fucking guitar. Chords, strings, sorry. Um, all right, there you go. Happy Thanksgiving. Let's get out of here. Happy Thanksgiving to you and yours, to all of you. You imagine how many Thanksgivings we've spent together? Isn't that crazy when you think about it? Like I mentioned, there are young people who have listened to me for half their life. There's in... A lot of people my age, whatever the fuck. It is just, I don't want to to do this too often because I find myself saying it a lot because I'm grateful that you're still here. So I'll just, I'll try to keep it as short as possible. Uh, Thanksgiving is again about being thankful for family and friends and your life. And I will tell you any semblance of a career or life in this business that I have is because of you people. You've tuned in, you've listened. You've listened when I was on it and you've listened when I've been bad or off it or you've you've just been there and you've been there to pick me up if I fall and you've been there, reached out, you've bought me a car, you bought me a second car, you listen to the show, you you send encouragement, you keep me afloat, you've joined Patreon and all these different things, you buy cameos, you you have allowed me to think that I have a career in this industry even in lieu of myself making the effort to have a career in this industry. Uh, and so I always say, well, I'm going to change and I'm going to show you guys and you blah, blah, blah. talk is cheap. I will do everything I can to make you all realize that you did not make a mistake so many years ago when you decided to support me. Cool. Again, I don't want to go over it. I don't want to, you know, bam, beat you over the head with a hammer and whatever the fuck. And then if I don't do a show for two weeks, somebody writes me and goes, what the fuck? You lied. But I, I don't, <laughs> whatever. And you're all, you're all welcome to your opinions and all of those things. And that's totally fine. But the very fact that you would include me in your lives, whether it's, it's to listen to me or when I visit your homes, um, you know, I've been there for holidays. I've seen people, I, I've so much has come to my life from this show and it's all because of you guys. And it makes me extremely happy. And uh, I'm humbled and I'm grateful at your generosity uh, or for your generosity and, and for all of you still being here. Anybody who's hearing my voice right now, I've always said anybody who ever heard me in the past, anyone who's ever laughed at anything I've ever said, you've you've made it possible for, possible for me to continue moving forward and try to be the best that I possibly can at the thing I've always wanted to do. And uh, I can't tell you enough how much I appreciate that. And I know... I'm in danger of making it sound fake when I keep saying it, but I have to express it to you. You have to know how much you mean to me. So I tell you, and there you go. So happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy the time with your families. Have some, uh, I hope, I hope you're seeing your families. I hope you're seeing friends, um, regardless of what you do with your Thanksgiving, whether you celebrate, whether you don't, whether you see family or friends or you're by yourself, I just hope you're the happiest and healthiest that you can possibly be. And please know, that there is room in my heart for all of you. And I love you guys. Thanks.
If there's anything I like more than me, it's people who like me. I love me, but if you love me, I love you. Cause you know why we both love me. How great am I? Let's talk about that for a while. And by a while, I mean forever. As a major research institution, Arizona State University offers the most online bachelor's degree programs, along with world-class faculty and dedicated support. Discover why ASU is ranked number one in innovation for nine consecutive years. Tap to learn more.